We're going to go ahead and get the meeting started. So if everyone would please uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call, please, Irene. Council Member Bagby. <laughs> Present. Council Member Brigham. Here. Council Member Cruz. Here. Vice Mayor Turner. Here. And Mayor Walter. Here. And uh, I have the sinking chair, so you will eventually see me go down underneath the table. <laughs> so just bear with me. I'm good, thank you. Okay, there was no closed session, so um, conflict of interest. Council members, anything? I have to recuse myself on item five and nine and 11. Part of 11. And part of 11. And uh, five, I will. Nine and 11. Okay. And I will likely have to recuse myself from a portion of item 11. There's no likely. I will have to recuse myself for a portion of item 11. Okay. I guess we can keep track of that. Me, I have to recuse no. myself on nine. Okay. When we, when, uh, council members, when we get to those numbers, please recuse yourself. <laughs> um, next is um, agenda review. David? Mayor, council members. Uh, the city manager would like to propose one modification to the agenda uh, if, if, if you're agreeable to uh, swap item seven and eight, just move eight to seven and seven to eight. Uh, item eight is the uh, presentation on the Sonoma County Energy <coughs> Independence Program, uh, PACE program, um, and modification to the agreement to implement uh, an agreement to allow property owners to engage in seismic strengthening improvements and wildfire safety improvements and we have a presentation and that enabled the presentation to be conducted prior to the uh, introduction of ordinance on the polystyrene. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you, David. Okay, next is public comment. Anyone wishing to address the city council on items that do not appear on tonight's agenda may do so. Just step up to the podium. There's a little pad there for you to jot your name down. Uh, give us your name and tell us what you have to say. So would anybody like to address the council on items that are not on today's agenda? Tony, I think you're up. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Walter, uh, Vice Mayor Turner, uh, distinguished members of the Cloverdale City Council. That's always a great, to, great uh, time to visit uh, Cloverdale uh, throughout the year, it doesn't matter. I love coming up here. So my name is Tony Giraldi. I'm a resident of Santa Rosa. Um, I'm also the uh, general manager of Sonoma County Airport Express, which happens to be the primary sponsor of the Miss Sonoma County Scholarship Competition, uh, which I also serve as the uh, treasurer, uh, parents coordinator, and secretary. Um, I'm here to, uh, to invite members of the city council to the 74th annual Miss Sonoma County Scholarship Competition uh, taking place on Saturday, March 7th, at the Spreckles Performing Arts Center in Rare Park at 7 p.m. Uh, we'll be selecting our 74th Miss Sonoma County. We'll also be selecting our Miss Sonoma County's that's 19. Uh, a little bit about the Miss Sonoma County Scholarship Program. It's been in existence for 74 years. Um, it's, uh, yeah, every year for the last 74 years, we've had a uh, Miss Sonoma County. It's the longest continuous uh, running program under the Miss California organization, uh, which also uh, is under the Miss America organization. Uh, throughout the years, uh, uh, we have uh, 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 given uh, scholarship money for future education to over 1,000 uh, uh, deserving young ladies here in Sonoma County. It's, um, the program is also recognized for our title holders being so embedded in the community. Our typical Miss Sonoma County makes over 150 appearances a year. Uh, Mr. McKenna's last 19, a little bit less, uh, more like uh, 90 or so. And it's uh, um, just a fantastic program. As elected officials, uh, 
Uh, if you're able to attend that evening, uh, you'll be recognized, introduced. And uh, last year, I think we had close to 28 elected officials from Sonoma, throughout Sonoma County. Love to have you there, and uh, thank you for your time. So. Thank you, Tony. Would anyone else like to address the City Council on items not on to this evening's agenda? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can't just forget about me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so my name is Rhiannon, I'm the current Miss Sonoma County, and uh, I would also like to extend the invitation for all of you to come see our program. Um, I recognize, I think, all of you, so hi again. And it's always pleasant to come to Cloverdale. Um, one of my most fond memories here is actually after the tree lighting ceremony, I had had problems with my dog in the morning, and then I went to work, and I got off work late, and I drove up here, and it was pouring rain, and I forgot a jacket. <coughs> And I was in a miserable mood. I'm kind of a grumpy per person naturally, so a lot of this is face. But I was in such a miserable mood, and I, to be quite honest, did not want to be here. And I got out of my car, and I was kind of like, to the, to the city council meeting, but all of your faces just like lit up my day. And being here and meeting the amazing Santa Claus, I called my mom, and I said, Mom, I think I met the real Santa Claus in Cloverdale, <laughs> because he was phenomenal. And just all the amazing council members and city, city people of Cloverdale just made my night so much brighter. And I went home in such a good mood. And that's something that every time that I go to Cloverdale, it is a trek. I live down in Roanoke Park, and it's a mm. trek to get up here. But it's always worth it. It's always worth the gas. It's always worth the time. The city is so beautiful, and a lot of that is thanks to you. So we would love to give you guys a night of entertainment. It's going to be an amazing night. Come support the wonderful young ladies that we have competing. And I would also love to request a photo with all of you. Yeah, right. right now, right now, right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be great if that's possible. <laughs> yes, why don't we come down there and take a picture? That works. Thank you. Yeah, why don't we recess? Zoe, you got your camera? Okay. <laughs> We're going to recess for two minutes, maybe. Yeah. You, you know, it'll. No, all of us should be in it. Uh, you know, it'd be easier if you came up here because Councilmember Cruz has a has a bum knee right now, and uh, it'd be easy if you came up here. Yeah. Come around. Come around. Yeah. Oh. Look at that. You. Coming back from a short recess, um, I'd like to conclude with the public comments. Anyone else wishing to address the council on items that are not on the agenda tonight? Please come up and share with us. Seeing no one, we're going to go ahead and close the public comment. And we're going to start with uh, item number one, which is a uh, presentation by Sonoma County for the wildfire prevention. And David, um, do you have this one? <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, members of council. Uh, I'd like to recognize uh, Supervisor Gore, uh, Supervisor for the 4th District, Supervisor Linda Hopkins, uh, and Fire Chief Boaz. Tonight, they are going to provide you an overview on a measure that's on the March ballot. Uh, it's referred to as the Sonoma County Wildfire Prevention Emergency Alert and Response Measure. It's a, um, a half cent sales tax measure. Uh, again, that's going to be uh, before the voters in March, and uh, Chief Boaz and uh, two of our honorable 
uh, supervisors are here tonight to provide the council with an overview of the uh, the measure. And as soon as we get the, the screen turned on, uh, we'll start the presentation. Thank you, David. And while we're doing that, I'd just like to, as always, welcome our fourth district supervisor, James Gore, to Cloverdale, and Linda Hopkins, um, the fifth district supervisor. Linda, it's great to see you. Um, and welcome to Cloverdale. I think it's, is it down all the way? It's down, it's, it's, it's on. We're good. Okay. It's warm enough. Chief, go, welcome to proceed. Hey, thank you, well good evening, Mayor Walter, members of council. Uh, my name is Jason Boaz, I'm the fire chief for the city of Hillsburg. I'm also the president of the Sonoma County Fire Chiefs Association, and in that regard, I sit on the fire service working group, which is the group that is, has been tasked with putting this project together. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Sonoma County Wildfire Prevention Emergency Alert and Response Measure to you this evening. Of course, I'm joined by Supervisor Linda Hopkins and Supervisor James Gore and some county staff. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Supervisor Gore. Good evening, everybody. Buenas tardes. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, before you today. One also, uh, the last time I was here with you all was uh, we were talking about getting ready for disasters. Uh, remember, we brought forward the item that had Nuestra Comunidad, uh, that we were looking at co-funding to get out into the community and prepare us for whatever, whatever may you, whatever had. And I think about the partnership and the collaboration and what you all put uh, down in terms of the uh, grunt work on resiliency. And I flash forward to the Kincaid fire and I, I, uh, I can't help but think about how this community rose up, how it was, uh, you know, an island in the midst of uh, Northern Island, kind of where all of us came. I lived here uh, during the Kincaid fire because we were evacuated from Hillsburg uh, with my mom and my stepdad and my kids over here. And, uh, and to see what you guys did at the, uh, at, you know, with, with, with the emergency operations center that you set up over at the firehouse, with the information you got out and other things, I just want to, I, I mean this from a heartfelt place, I want to honor the fact that you guys took it seriously that uh, you were ahead of the game. And the reason that we responded well to the Kincaid fire, and I'm not gonna transition this too much into this presentation, but it really was because we were ready. We were always a couple days ahead of the Kincaid fire. And uh, whereas the Tubbs fire, if you think about it, by starting from, the, from, from behind, it meant that it, it felt like it was a year before we finally caught up with the Tubbs fire and the pocket fire and the nuns fire, uh, the 2017 fire siege. So I think it's an appropriate theme uh, going forward, I do want to um, not not detract too much, but I want to say I've had some conversations with you all, and I know you've had the uh, meeting with some of the folks, Daniel Holmesy and others, and you had some people, members from our staff here, and we're going to still continue to try and figure out how we build that resilience into the next step. Uh, one of the things I mentioned to the city manager in a recent conversation was, uh, I think we have to we have to stay very aware that. Uh, that the, the really one of the only large areas that hasn't suffered a vegetation fire in eastern Sonoma County is the northern part of it, right? So if you think about where the pocket fire went, uh, if you think about then uh, uh, the Kincaid fire kind of fit in between the pocket and the Tubbs fire, uh, you know, we're really still looking up at Pine Mountain in those areas. So I think one of the things that I'd like to do with you all and whatever subcommittees you form and however you want to do that is really uh, sit down, not just do the community outreach that's out there, but sit down and do uh, the exercise kind of training. Like how do we, you know, we, we have a good COPE group that's up on Pine Mountain. Uh, Steve Nurse and others have, have done a good job of bringing them together. Uh, so I think there's an opportunity for us to get ahead of that and say, hey, if we're in a situation here in Cloverdale, like Hillsburg was, where uh, in that night you have to defend a territory and you have to do evacuations, what, what really happens and how do you do it? And I'll uh, be the first person to say is, is that testing systems and live code like we've done recently with our alert and warning systems and other things allow your community to come along the ride for you and see what are the opportunities but also what are the inconsistencies with technology and other things. So I, I just really, uh, I, I just had to say that to kind of start this off. And so switching over, um, you know, I've been on uh, a number of ad hocs and now my, uh, my colleague and dear friend and partner in progress, uh, Supervisor Linda Hopkins from the 5th District 
district has been on our fire ad hoc the last couple of years and really worked with a group of fire chiefs from throughout Sonoma County, a comprehensive group, to come up with this. And uh, what is this? It's, uh, it's an injection of vital resources into the fire system. Um, I know there's a lot of things that we need to discuss tonight, uh, but the reality is is that, you know, even though our board started about five years ago to put a lot more money into fire services, uh, the leap step that's required to be able to uh, depend on our own really doesn't exist right now. Uh, in the situation of the Kincaid, uh, we had mutual aid and we were ready with forecasting to get people on the ground right away. But we do know from learning from our neighbors in other counties, whether it's uh, San Diego, whether it's Santa Barbara, Lake County, Butte, others, is that you also have to depend on your own for the first 72 hours of any event. And um, I could look behind me and I saw uh, President of the Fire uh, District, uh, Carol Giovanotto. Uh, I saw uh, Bob Taylor. I saw uh, Chief Jenkins back there. I see Chief Gosner from Santa Rosa and uh, Mike Pagoni also. I see a lot of fire services individuals back here. And these are the folks who have been fighting for the last uh, really 20, 30 years along with uh, Chief Boaz scraping along, trying to add capacity without the proper funding and do all these other things. So I applaud their work, but, you know, at the same time, ultimately we all have to step up. The county has put, uh, you know, five to seven million dollars recently over the last couple of years into its fire services. That's been general fund money. Uh, we've upped our game in terms of creating a one million dollar pot for uh, upstaffing during fire events. Uh, which was utilized this last year when, uh, when we were able to upstaff during red flag warnings and other things. But this is a half cent fire tax. This is a lot of money. This is an injection into the system. And if you look at kind of the details, really focus on North County specifically, uh, uh, you know, Hillsburg, uh, we had a presentation there. Uh, the Geyserville Fire Protection District, uh, $2.5 million coming out of this measure. Uh, Cloverdale, if it does, if, if it does pass, uh, would get uh, upwards of $940,000, $950,000. So um, with that being said, I just want to set the stage because, uh, you know, we have some, some slides here, introductory ones, but I want us to kind of jump into, into some of the details. And when, when we jump into the details, I want us to talk about a couple pertinent items. Number one. Is, uh, is I know from conversations with, uh, with your council and your city manager, there's uh, one issue, which is this, this world of consolidation. Hey, yeah, if we put, uh, if, if Cloverdale, the incorporated area, but let's say the entire fire district, if we're putting 500 to 600,000 and we're getting 950 back, that's nice, but we're worried about kind of like Katati was, this wording that says, uh, you know, if you don't consolidate, what's wrong there? And I want to talk through that a little bit, uh, maybe in the question and answer period, and also have my colleague bring it up because they talked about it in Katadi. There's a variety of ways that we can help uh, address that with you as a board. Uh, you know, I can say the intent was never to do that. The intent of the consolidation language is because uh, people like Bob Taylor, who's my dear friend, who sits down with us and shows me a piece of paper that shows that Sonoma County, as of eight years ago, still had, I believe it was, how many? 37? Yeah, about, about, about three dozen fire districts. And, you, you know, we're illustrious in Sonoma County. We have the most fire districts, the most school districts, and the most small water districts of any commensurate county in the nation. Uh, and we beat them all. So that's not how you achieve efficiency. So a policy goal of efficiency is not really what's going to drive where the dollars go ultimately, but I want you guys to make sure that you're confident and if we also need to look at resolutions and other things from our board that match intent to other things, uh, that we look at that. So that's one item I want to make sure you guys have. The second is, is I know what it's like to have a community and, uh, and folks like us as a county come to you and say, you know, we're looking at a half cent sales tax. And, uh, the, you know, the, like, well, wh what does that mean for other kind of taxes we might want to put on the, on, on the ballot as in Cloverdale, right? Do we have other needs that are there? How, what does this create to the community? And I, I, and I understand that, and I, um, and, I, and I acknowledge it, and I don't know um, how, how to get at that more than just to say that, uh, that the goal here is not just going from $500,000 in from Cloverdale, $940,000 out, and then a wider system. The goal is to create a mutual aid system. The goal is to have 200 firefighters more on the ground uh, to be able to go after what we need to and not to depend on mutual aid throughout the state. Because as we know, if 2017 was in 19, we would not have 3,000 individuals on the ground. They would have been dispersed throughout the state. So uh, those are my, you know, uh, it's very dangerous to allow me to do an introduction. Uh, I say that because 
you know, I took a big presentation and probably picked uh, parts out of the conclusion and the middle and the other side, but I want to really let Supervisor Hopkins and Jason Boaz come up and take us through the presentation. My colleague has been well vested into this, and, uh, and so I'd love to invite her to come up, and, uh, and I thank you for your leadership on bringing this forward. Um, well, you know, it's, it feels really appropriate, actually, to stand up here and not actually as your um, sort of fifth district supervisor representing West County, but actually as the former farmer for your city manager um, who used to pick up vegetables uh, out at the farm. And, and to me, that's actually a really great sort of intro to the fact that we are all interdependent and interconnected in Sonoma County, right? It is such a small community. And one of the most critical things um, is that Fire knows no jurisdictional boundaries. And so when we set out to develop the sales tax measure, um, well, first of all, we didn't set out actually to develop a sales tax measure. We set out to solve a problem, right? And that problem was trying to create effective, efficient, sustainable fire services countywide. Name me one person who lives, works, plays, shops, and travels and recreates in the exact same fire protection district. It doesn't exist, right? We all constantly are going between different safety nets as we travel around Sonoma County. And the idea here is that you will be safe no matter where you travel in Sonoma County and that hopefully, again, you know, knock on all the wood, um, that we will actually have the resources needed to stop a large-scale conflagration when it starts, right? That there's actually someone there. Because we've been faced with, you know, declining resources, especially in rural areas of the county that have long relied on volunteers that are often hard to come by these days. Um, so I'm, I'm here to sort of stand up in favor of mutual aid and recognizing that no matter where we go, we are all part of the same safety net and that we are only as strong truly as our weakest link in the system. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on what Supervisor Gore said. Uh, you know, just looking back at the Kincaid fire, we did make a lot of changes and do a lot of things differently than 2017, and I think it helped a lot. Alert and warning was one of them. I think it was a lot more effective and efficient. Um, all the upstaffing we did in the county certainly helped in the, in the initial part of the fire. The one thing that we really need to recognize is that the Kincaid fire at the time was really the only significant fire in the state of California, which is unlike 2017 where there were well over 100 fires in the state. And because of that, we were able to enjoy a large amount of mutual aid um, fairly quickly. And it was only a couple days after the Kincaid fire started that we began seeing some other fires in Southern California, which began pulling resources that way. Uh, so the point is, we're understaffed in the county on a daily basis to, to, uh, to provide the effective firefighting force that we need for events like this. Uh, we, have, we enjoy great mutual aid, but we need to plan for the fact that it's not gonna be there. And we should have enough firefighters on duty across the county to, uh, to meet our own needs and not have to rely on mutual aid quite as much, especially on initial attack fires. And uh, if, we, if we can catch the fire small with the resources we have in the county right off the bat, maybe we can prevent the larger fires from happening. So we kind of jumped around the slides a little bit, but if you want to... I mean, just a little bit of background on, on uh, the fire service working group and how we got to the point we are now. It began kind of as a subgroup of uh, the Fire Chiefs Association. Uh, we later added on uh, representatives from labor and, uh, and districts, boards. It began as the Fire Service Advisory Council back in 2016, and we've been working on it ever since. It's gone through a couple iterations. But now we're the Fire Services Working Group, and if you don't mind advancing one more slide, we can talk about who's on it. So my, myself, of course, I'm sitting on it as a representative of the Chiefs Association. But you can see we have a lot of very um, smart, talented, distinguished fire chiefs and board members on here and you know as Supervisor Hopkins alluded to when when we go into the room every week and meet for four hours we really do try to leave our patches and our badges at the door and our egos and try to make decisions for what's best for the county the county fire services and what we saw what we see and what we we're striving for is to fill the the gaps in the services and they are in more in the more rural areas and that's why you see in the expenditure plan staffing in, in more, more of the rural areas in the county. But the idea is to build the entire firefighting network in Sonoma County, right? Because we're only as strong as our neighbors. In Healdsburg, when we have a structure fire, we rely on Cloverdale. We rely 
on Geyserville and rely on Sonoma County Fire District and others. And it's, it, I think it's the same with Cloverdale and Geyserville. Uh, so the idea is as, as we build the, the network, we're helping each other. And, and that's really was the goal of this measure to begin with. And, and the goal was to put three people on a fire engine 24 hours a day in the areas that we thought most needed that enhanced level of staffing. There was one thing that I also want to clarify, um, which is that, you know, is this the county of Sonoma, I'll just be blunt, trying to pawn off a financial responsibility, um, you know, onto the taxpayers and the sort of sales tax um, payers of Sonoma County? And the answer is no, because technically the only fire sort of services that we are responsible for are CSA 40. Those are dependent districts. We do not need the sales tax measure to deal with those dependent districts. This is really about sort of solving for countywide fire services. Um, and I also want to mention a little bit of the revenue that we're actually already investing in fire services beyond CSA 40 to actually bolster that countywide system. Um, so currently we're actually investing over 1.5 million in Prop 172 revenues and actually more than $3 million of transient occupancy tax as well as other general fund sources. Um, and so some of that's actually going into incentivizing consolidation and cr providing some critical um, sort of services from the Sonoma County Fire District. So just want to um, make that very clear. And we also do have um, 10 volunteer companies down from 15 in 2011. So we are actually making progress towards consolidation each and every year. Um, and I also serve on the board of, of LAFCO and I'm ha happy to answer any LAFCO questions regarding consolidation as well. So as I mentioned, the goal with this was to increase the effective firefighting force, mostly by uh, putting three people on the fire engine in, in all these communities. But as this evolved, we also uh, talked a lot about you know, alert and warning, about vegetation management, about command and control, and all that kind of got worked into our recommendations um, as, as, uh, as we worked through this. You know, with, with wildfires occurring more frequently and spreading more rapidly, as I said, we, we really need to increase the amount of uh, firefighting force that we have on duty. Maybe next slide. Uh, I want to address a few of these real quickly. Uh, thank you, Chief, uh, Chief Boaz. But, uh, so vegetation management, wildfire prevention, and preparedness. The next slide really goes into uh, alert and warning also. Uh, the key here with those two items, and I, I, I don't need to elaborate, I don't need to go on forever, though, is that um, I, I'll even quote uh, uh, one of our chiefs from, uh, fr from, from North County who when we uh, uh, sat with a community meeting in Geyserville at one point, he, he looked at us and, and very openly said two things. One is, is that currently under the current system, when you need me at the, uh, when, when you all need me, it's likely I won't be there. And that's a very tough thing for a fire chief to say to folks. Why? Because there's not enough of me, uh, you know, in terms of what we need to do and what I need to protect. And that's why we need to invest in these systems and other things. The second thing he said is, is that the days on the movies of firefighters sitting around polishing fire trucks waiting for a fire to call are gone. That's why you see, I think what you've already seen is not just through Geyserville, Hillsburg, and Cloverdale, but you've seen throughout predominantly North County, but in other areas, the development of COPE teams and CERT teams, right? Citizens organized to prepare for emergencies. Now you have uh, some trainings for citizen emergency response teams. You know, it, it's, it's kind of flying all over the place, and the need is to centralize and move that forward, but it's positive. Uh, with respect to alert and warning and uh, systems, I mean specifically, uh, you know, the, fact, the biggest thing that allowed us to turn the page on what I would call the biggest black eye from 2017, which was this community outcry that you did not use your alert and warning system and then all of us supervisors, well, we never reviewed it. Let's go into the plan. Why wasn't it utilized? Why wasn't it brought to us? Why, why, why was this not a, a thing? Well, ultimately, the, the, the response was is that we weren't confident enough in the system to be able to use it without causing uh, chaos, right? That was kind of what it said. And uh, ultimately, if you look at it from somebody who's hindsight 2020 or somebody in my position, your position, you look back and you say, well, all I can say is, is that in any disaster, you never want to leave a single thing on the table that you could have utilized. 
And uh, if you're worried about doing something that causes more harm and ultimately that's leading to people not having adequate information, that can't happen going forward. So uh, very, very excited that we were able to push and have two lar largest in the Western United States over the last two years, alert and warning tests, last year in Cloverdale as well, and I think we need to look at that again. But that's also another aspect of this, is to continue to turbocharge the system. Because as you guys all know, is, is that information is power in these situations. Uh, people will call you relentlessly, uh, and just because they need information to be able to go to sleep. It's not that they want it, they need information. Uh, the uh, WIA system and the text push alerts are moving in the next year, year or so with FCC approval from 90 characters to 350 characters. That also includes better work on translation. That includes links to maps and other things. So a big part of this is also continuing to invest in that. So as we move forward, I'll, I'll highlight um, kind of what's in it for Region 6. I'm sure you're all aware what Region 6 is, but maybe people in the audience aren't. Region 6 is our, our, our fire zone that is basically north of Windsor. It includes the city of Hillsburg, Knights Valley, Geyserville, Cloverdale, uh, Sodiomi, and Fitch Mountain. And collectively, we're, we're Region 6. What this plan builds in for Region 6 are 19 full-time positions, full-time staff positions uh, that bring, would bring Cloverdale fire up to three on the engine. Uh, same with the Geyserville's main station, and then there's funding for a second station in Geyserville with, with nine personnel in it. In addition, unlike some of the other regions, one of the things we identified as a need for Region 6 was command and control. So there's, there's also three battalion chief positions built into this, uh, and we envision that as uh, one battalion chief in each agency, one in Geysville, one in Cloverdale, one in Hillsburg, and um, most likely on shift, although um, we, we know our, our chiefs, we still need to get together and work out a lot of the details of this. We're not <coughs> trying to force anything on anybody. Um, in addition, I mentioned the station, uh, which we're hoping could be built in Chalk Hill, and then uh, the Hillsburg Montage Station on the north end, which isn't a staff station, but I envision that more as a regional training center. That's kind of the way I've designed it so that all of our agencies, Geyserville, Cloverdale, Hillsburg, um, even Dry Creek Rancheria, we can all get together there and train. It's kind of a, a North County hub. So uh, we could also upstaff that station as needed during red flag warnings and, you know, and we can work with the chiefs and maybe come up with some kind of type of creative staffing there. But uh, Specific to Cloverdale, as I mentioned, uh, one battalion chief and three full-time firefighters that would bring you up to three on the engine 24 hours a day and, and one battalion chief. And that, that was kind of the goal. And how, you know, how the fire chiefs utilize um, the tax money and the staffing is, is up to them, and how they utilize their crews with vegetation management, alert and warning, all that is, is again, up to the individual fire chiefs to work that out. We're, we're not trying to dictate what people have to do. We're just trying to provide the resources for them to do it. Did you want to talk a little bit about consolidation or should we just go past it? Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we do have fewer fire protection agencies in Sonoma County today than last year and the year before that. Um, consolidation has really increased the cost effectiveness of fire services already and there's definitely an opportunity to do more. The good thing about this measure is it offers both a carrot and a stick to further regionalization and consolidation efforts. Um, so essentially, the idea is that you will not get funding if you commit to maintaining your own little tiny island in the middle of West County. Um, and you know, this is a message that I have had to deliver to all of the different fire chiefs, um, certainly in my district. I'm not going to tell them which direction to go, but I am gonna tell them that they need to partner up with a neighbor. And um, this will actually be reviewed by both LAFCO as well as the Board of Supervisors, whether regionalization and consolidation is moving forward. Um, and if not, a four-fifths vote by the Board of Supervisors could actually pull the funding back. Um, so again, we sort of have the carrot, which is you come together with your partners, you do get this enhanced staffing, and you do get this increased funding. Um, but if you fail to move on that path towards regionalization and consolidation, and you are that little, you know, sort of small shop out in West County, and it usually is out in West County, um, that says that they're not going to play with any of their neighbors, we do have an opportunity to um, remove the funding in order to further incentivize consolidation.
I want to run through the last few here pretty quickly. Citizen oversight and accountability, like a lot of tax measures, uh, this has an expenditure plan that you all are, are probably aware of. That's what we're going through right now. Uh, the way taxes for the public and everybody are set up is sometimes you'll go with a general tax. I got, I remember uh, getting elected and being asked to come up and talk to you guys about a general tax for roads, which seems like an anachronism, and I remember specifically Marianne and others, and like, well, what assurance do we have that you'll spend it on roads? Well, we're going to create this super unique lockbox, and you no. Know. So this is a this is a a specific tax. This is a 66 two thirds vote, uh, 66 and 6 uh, percent. Independent audits, uh, annual reports. I want to go back to this uh, real quickly. Uh, I, you don't have to go back on the screen, but this issue of consolidation and Supervisor Hopkins talked about uh, money and movement and what's going on. I want to also remind folks uh, that uh, in, through really the groundswell work, not driven by me, but me driven by them, I've really uh, applauded the work of Cloverdale and Geyserville, Geyserville and Knights Valley, and then uh, the, the conversations that we've initiated, and we have to keep moving forward with Hillsburg as well on the Zone 6 side. Uh, your board with uh, Cloverdale and the board of Geyserville uh, have ad hocs that have been meeting. They already are pursuing uh, Geyserville moving forward to LAFCO with uh, discussions on municipal services review and sphere of influence for these areas. So you're, 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 you're well on the way from your local leadership in terms of creating efficiencies. But I would also stress that, you know, the point that Supervisor Hopkins makes, and it was really relevant for Katati as well, is uh, with uh, Shell Vista and other areas, is they already have really a consolidated district. So they're saying, we have this huge area, uh, we've, already, we've already done the work, we've gone out with property taxes, why the hell would you come in and tell me I'm not consolidating more? Um, I actually look at that in the same degree as with Cloverdale. You have a large district. Uh, it is not a municipal district. It is a fire district that serves you as a city well, but also serves uh, the western and he eastern hills very well, too. Uh, one of the things that Supervisor Hopkins and I talked about as well is, as a part of this, whether you all decide to uh, uh, stay neutral, support, uh, hopefully, or not support is your, is your choice. But ultimately, if you did so, you could also do so with a request to the Board of Supervisors to pass a resolution or something like that that says we want more certainty and we want a resolution that talks about these larger land base areas. And so I just want to, you know, throw that out there as a potential. Um, can I go forward two slides? I'm going to take us kind of uh, through the end of this unless you guys want to uh, jump in. Okay. So the polling research came out, you know, uh, we, 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 we funded uh, quite a big poll and there's also a campaign moving along with this. Um, if you look at the quantitative survey of likely voters in March, if we look over into, uh, uh, you know, what we were doing in terms of what we were hearing from folks and, and Supervisor Boaz could talk to this a lot, but uh, I just want to keep moving us through is, is that people were loud and clear about wanting to have other aspects other than just firefighters uh, added. They wanted vegetation management, they wanted alert and warnings, they wanted those kind of things that they really see in their community. And I think they're right. It means they're paying attention to this whole movement towards resilience that we've talked about. Because you can improve all these systems, but if people don't take care of their land better, if you don't have good uh, right-of-way clearance, uh, if you don't do evacuation testing like we've done in, uh, in jurisdictions around here, uh, then uh, you're really not ahead of the game. Uh, the polling shows, uh, shows very good. It's been right at that uh, 64 to 67, 68 percent. So it means it's a, it's, it's a battle, right? But a lot of this, this, this was all taken prior to the Kincaid fire, which shows well for this kind of a, uh, not, not that we wanted that, but uh, it shows well for the need of what's going on. Uh, the, dis the decision was made by the group to go after uh, a half cent sales tax and not a quarter cent sales tax. And that's specifically because there was a review by the county, not by the county, with really the chiefs and others, that brought forth something called the silver plan, colloquially as the silver plan. And we all jokingly say, why would you call the best in case the silver plan? Then, you know, why not the gold plan? Well, the gold plan is up to the highest level of standard, and it's really unattainable by all of us. So the silver plan meets your, means you're meeting, uh, you know, uh, basically a standard of coverage amongst all the fire agencies throughout the county that can, that can meet an independent look and say, you are operating at a level that can manage not only your people, right, and, your, uh, and the tourists who come in and all these other things that you manage, but for us, I think the biggest thing is, is that we have to also be able to go into the hills and manage the vegetation and do all these things so that we're more resilient going forward. Um, I want to uh, move on to the next 
So the Board of Supervisors, we brought it forward to us. Uh, I mean, a, a, as we say, it's kind of interesting how this works because I remember when I was on the ad hoc and I looked at a group of about, uh, of about uh, 30 fire chiefs and, uh, you know, there ain't no fight like a firefight. I tell you, this is, you know, as much as we're trying to protect a, a unified or a somewhat unified voice, uh, you, you, you probably heard. I mean, it's not perfect. It's never perfect because you sit down at the table and you negotiate. You negotiate what comes to the table. It was brought forward once to us. It was brought forward another time to us after labor was included. Uh, there was folks from certain districts, including my own, that I had to go toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe in the board chambers and try and figure out where the money was and what it was going to do and allocating things out. Uh, and ultimately, we came up with what we feel is, uh, is, is a damn good... Uh, um, a, a damn good ordinance, and please quote me on that, and, um, and something that will protect Sonoma County for years to come. So uh, with that being said, I just I, I hope we can uh, take whatever q and I apologize for taking a long time, but I, 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 outside of just the presentation, I always uh, hope to give you context. So uh, uh, Mr. Mayor and however you'd like to take us forward. Okay. Thank you, James, and uh, uh, for the presentation. I'm going to bring it up to the City Council now for you to ask questions before it up to public comment and then bring it back to the city council so why don't we start on my right here Monda would you like to start with any questions that you have yes um, <clears throat> when um, this plan for Cloverdale came about um, was that something that Chief Jenkins also agreed to was he consulting well, I'll be glad to answer that but if Chief Jenkins wants to come up and Add, he can too. So what we did is we met with uh, all the chiefs from all the different regions. We brought them in uh, at least two different times into the fire service working group to solicit their input. And I believe we integrated just about everything they, they okay. brought. So, so to answer your question is yes, we did uh, um, reach out to the chiefs and bring them in to get their input. And, uh, I'm being specific to Cloverdale at this point. Um, uh, the four full-time staff positions, what does that mean? Uh, it says staffing well, four full-time staff positions and one regional battalion chief and three full-time firefighters. Right, so what that means is right now, as, as I understand, you have two full-time firefighters on the engine every day. This would add a third, would also add a battalion chief position. Um, and as I said, Chief Jenkins. Oh, so you're referring to those four? Yes. Okay. All right. Four positions. And, and what happens to the administrative assistant that is currently there? Um, you're talking about the enhanced services funding. Yeah. So my understanding is that will that will continue and it will be um, funded through the tax. Okay. And. Right. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Stand by. I want to make sure I'm correct on that. Hi, Andrew Kraut with County of Sonoma. So it's my understanding that that enhanced service funding is for two years, and then it could be used, the, the t tax could apply to that enhanced service uh, going forward. Okay, thank you. And then... So if, 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 the enhanced, if we didn't continue the enhanced, enhanced services, then um, you would lose those three positions. We'd be back to two. And the goal, as I said, is to have three on the engine. So that's well, what we're working through. We've got to go back and fight for again. So that's okay. then I, I apologize. Uh, I just wanted to say that. The enhanced funds, Cloverdale for a long time and, and their board and Chief Jenkins could obviously speak more to this uh, than anybody, but when I became a supervisor, there was already some uh, agreement in place from even when McGuire was a supervisor to provide some enhanced uh, services. And in, in those days, it was about $100,000 a year that we were trying to get in and develop into the system because it was operating at a system that was below what was needed for the area. And that's not only Cloverdale City, which is obviously... Uh, something that's containable, but you think about the wide area around the district itself. Uh, we were, through the last iteration of uh, funding measures that were coming along, it, that went up to two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, give or take. I'm looking around to make sure nods yes, nods yes. Same thing for Geyserville, and the goal there was to get us up to that three O staffing or the two O staffing at that time. I think we were at one point and a half, and uh, and then to, and, and then to move it forward, but. Uh, I think once again, my thing is, is also is with the chiefs is the discussion continually of not just this 2 over 3 -oh, but are they going to be like out in the community doing stuff? Because obviously me as a, as a supervisor, when I go out and say, hey, let's organize, uh, it's very different than when you have somebody with a badge who uh, has the resources and the knowledge. 
Okay, thank you. And then I have one more question regarding uh, the network of sirens of, on stations and apparatus, including high-low sirens. Um, we would have to install those here. Who's going to run with the uh, cost? Well, ultimately, I mean, all the costs for anything that you would all would want to do, <coughs> whether it's with the fire district or with the sheriff, for us, the sheriff, for you, the police department, would is, is really for you to decide what you do. I mean, ultimately, what Sonoma County has done, and the high-low sirens are specifically tuned for us in rural areas, predominantly. Uh, we would use them in a city if there is earthquake and other things, but in these situations where we've been able to now forecast better for management, the highest priority for the high-low sirens, and that's why we've been using them in exercises, driving up and back Mill Creek Road this year. We want to go back out to Palomino Lakes. These areas where we have cell coverage issues, where we have connectivity issues and other things. So you're absolutely right. You'd have to, you'd have to consider if that's an appropriation that you all want to make directly to your police, which is not this through the fire, or if that's a coordination you make with them. So, um, so basically, the idea um, in a section written under the measure in terms of the Department of Emergency Management would work with individual communities to find the best solution for them. So it would definitely be a conversation with the council. Um, Chris Godley right now has been actually analyzing various parts of the county and what solution would work best for each individual part. We have very mountainous terrain, you know, where uh, that are they're very isolated areas. Maybe sort of sirens work in individual canyons. There's there are a lot of things that can factor um, into this lack or presence of self cell phone reception or broadband, um, various things. And so we do have, there is an opportunity for you to sort of work with us and partner with us to determine what emergency alert and warning system would be best for this particular area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Turner? Yes, please. <clears throat> Understanding that a level of the funding has been earmarked towards uh, bolstering staff, um, ensuring the other aspects of uh, this presentation, and we meet the criteria that doesn't concern in such a way to pass a four-fifths vote to decrease funding, what percentage would you say is left over to allow the chiefs to make expenditures towards things that they believe would be beneficial to their own district? Well, let me jump in. Because the first thing is, is that what is in the tax plan as an expenditure, as an expenditure report? Is there in buckets because we don't want to overprescribe what people can do locally. And I'll give you an example is, is that one of the things that I've had to work closely with your chief and your fire board on is, is that actually is after we approved the enhanced services contract for Cloverdale is we didn't get too much into the business as the county is functioning that as an audit control mechanism. And I'll, I will say that there was some of that when I, when I first entered. There was some uh, like you, you, this world where, okay, I'll give you the money, but have you shown me you can do this and this? Um, that has not been what I've seen to be the case recently. And the other thing is, is that for this, I know I just keep looking back at you like I'm going to put you on the hot seat, man. It's like <coughs> I'm, tying, I'm tying the noose for you right now. I, I, I apologize. I won't do that again. What I mean by this, though, is, is that the allocation for Cloverdale, outside of what the projection is for staffing, there is flexibility to move it within that for what are the needs of the area. Yeah, so if I can just add to that. If, I, if I'm understanding your question right, there will be some discretion, for, of course, for the fire chiefs. Um, the intention of this tax was to enhance fire services, not to supplant current funding that is already in place. That being said, we also discussed that I, I think it's during the first three years of the tax, um, if there are needs in the department that are directly related to enhancing services, whether it's equipment, turnouts, SCBAs, if, if, if that can be shown as... Um, enhancing services or um, adding to, uh, the, the, you know, the, the gear, the training, everything that the new firefighters have, then, then that would be in the spirit of the tax. What we'll do is uh, we're expecting annual audits. So the money will come into the fire district and we'll just be expected to report on what they spent it on or didn't spend it on, right? So, th so there's some discretion there. For example, um, it's going to take, I mean, I don't know how, it's going to be difficult to hire 200 firefighters in Sonoma County. Uh, so that's what, there's going to be kind of a lag time between um, the time that we can fly all those job announcements, do all those tests, hire all those firefighters and battalion chiefs. But we put that language in there. So, for example, 
um, there's a battalion chief position. And I'm not saying this is what Chief Jenkins wants to do, but just as an example, there's a battalion chief position, that person might need a vehicle. So the way the tax is written in the first three years of that tax, if that position is not filled, the money can be redirected towards purchasing a vehicle for the position that's coming on. Does that make sense? Okay, so I just, I just wanted to elaborate that on that a little bit. So there is some flexibility. There's still a pretty good level or good spirit of local control within the parameters that you're setting forth of uh, bringing the resources together wherever possible. There is still a spirit of here are some resources to do with what you would feel best for your area. That's the way I would interpret it, yeah. We're, we really are not trying to, um, you know, the money will be for staffing. It'll be up to Chief Jenkins and myself in order to figure out how to spend that, best spend that money for staffing. Same with the capital funds. Uh, we're not directing people exactly how to spend it, but it's got to fit within the, the different buckets and it's got to be accountable and, and it, the idea is not to supplant any current funding. Thank you. Council Member Brigham. Anything at this point? No, really, just thanks for the presentation. Councilmember Bagby. If you want, I can walk through. Um, I don't know if it's in your packet, but so, oh no, they're not broken out. The six, 698,700 is for staffing. And then, uh, I think either yeah, 219,300 would be for recruitment and tension. And um, the idea with that is, as we bring on these new firefighters, we kind of use the Sonoma County Fire District salary as the, as the base, for better or for worse. So uh, some districts may not be at that level yet. Some places like the City of Hillsburg may be above that. So in order to keep ourselves from cannibalizing one another, uh, there's recruitment and retention funds, which is essentially um, boost salaries up to an equal level so that your neighboring district doesn't fly in a job announcement and take all nine of your people in, in, over there because they're getting paid a little bit more. So um, that was a difficult discussion, but we felt that was the only, we had to do that in order to keep from cannibalizing ourselves. That gives me another question, if I may, real quick. What kind of agreements do you have with the labor unions to keep that from maybe spiraling to a level that you weren't quite prepared for? No, I, I can't really speak to, to labor's stance on this, on it. You know, we had, um, Tim Ambadero is the president of 1401 um, and kind of represents labor in the county, uh, sit on the fire service working group, but um, I'm, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you're asking me. Well, Spiraling out of control. Are we going to spend all the money on pensions and uh, benefits? And I don't, I, I, don't, I don't mean that that's not exactly what you were saying, but I think the question is, is what are the controls in place to make sure that things are, th things are going appropriately? I well, mean, to be honest, if I knew you yeah. had it, I'd ask for it, wouldn't I? Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Right? But that's also what's going on right now with Cloverdale and Geyserville and their discussions. They have two different labor standards that if Geyserville and Cloverdale somehow became not a JPA but actually annexed together, Geyserville would have to up their uh, level of pay for their own folks. So, you know, you have, you, you have that system throughout Sonoma County, but, um, but, but, but also, um, I mean, I would just say that the amount of money that's allocated puts it into the, into the hands of the, ch of, of the chief, the recruitment, okay. retention, and also the additional staffing. So, and you know that what chiefs want in this area too is equipment and comprehensive services. So uh, the other thing that's kind of a wiggle, and I don't want to get too far into it, but what we've discussed with not just North County but some other areas is that if this money, if, if this is to pass in this way, uh, what we've been pursuing in North County for a long time is a tax transfer agreement, which basically means is that you don't ultimately hold a lot of these funds over for the county to decide forever in the future. You write an agreement that transfers that allotment of money over to local control into the future. And there's some, some that have gone through. There was a Sonoma County Fire District that went through. They took four agencies, consolidated them into one. We supplemented the money because our policy was for helping... Uh, create consolidation and bring them down so it's in their best interest to create equalization. There's this other wrinkle on the side, which is you might have heard that even Geyserville is having a public discussion about putting a parcel tax on the ballot, right, in, a, in addition to this. And that is not abnormal. I mean, in, in, Geyserville currently has basically zero parcel tax. Uh, C, uh, uh, Bodega Bay has 520 uh, dollars a parcel, which is the highest in the entire state of California. All of these fire districts 
over the course of time either put partial taxes on the ballot or didn't, depending on what they could get the community to buy into. If you go speak with LAFCO and the executive director, Mark Bramfit, there's kind of this assumption that for fire districts to be sustainable, not even from the sales tax, which obviously takes a whole, a, a whole gander of this, of, of, of this discussion, but if that, if, if, uh, but that partial taxes should be around 180 to $220 per parcel in general to cover this. So let's just say that this tax does not pass, and I think it bears witness to say this. I can tell you for a fact what you're going to see behind it is a lot of more individual. You're going to probably see another 15 different parcel taxes opening up around the different areas, but you're going to also find districts that say, you know, this is a yes and because for us to do the veg management work out there, it needs to be done. So from my perspective, I've always been somebody who's focused on results. I don't have problems. I... I trust good pensions and other things, but not balloon. So, I don't know if that provides some no, context, just, but... I, and I appreciate it. The little bit of context I want to give is I just saw that I think it was the president of Local 1401 was on the advisory board, and so that's what led, me, that's what led to my question, so thank you. Okay. Council Member Bagby, anything thank at this time? You. Thank you. Just um, a couple of questions just to follow up on the JPA question, which of course is in process. Do you see the th that... For, formation of the JPA meeting the criteria of the measure, and if it doesn't, what does meet the maximum? We don't, when do you stop consolidating? Well, the ultimate, the, the ultimate word consolidation does not have a definition behind it, and the, and the reason for that is we as a board have been very focused on LAFCO proceedings as being a place to go through that. Mm -hmm. So let's just say that you either wanted to fully annex all of them at four into one, like Sonoma, Sonoma District. If, uh, if North County came in and said Cloverdale and Geyserville, and Geyserville had annexed like they have before Knights Valley, and, uh, and even if Hillsburg for a while was maybe a partnership at JPA with that, it's not the construct of if it's a JPA or an annexation, it's are you achieving truly benefits, efficiency benefits through LAFCO process. And that's why you go through a municipal services review, a sphere of influence through that process so that you can justify it. Because at the end of the day, for example, when the Sonoma County Fire District one came before us, we were able to take a look at it and have the confidence that the measures in place were not just bundling three together, but they actually were achieving efficiency. And it kind of goes back to this idea of uh, 37 or, or three dozen fire districts try managing fire with, with 37 fire chiefs. Uh, and then if you think about that outside of the municipal ones, uh, every single one has a board uh, with five members, a lot of them, their their grandfather or great grandfather, or great grandmother helped create it. You know, they're self suffice. They're, they're creating their 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 money to to move forward with pancake breakfasts and other things. And you know how it is. I mean, I'm I'm speaking to the choir. I'll stop. But uh, but that's that, that's the intent right there is to utilize LAFCO as the clearinghouse for consolidations. Okay. So in other words, it's pretty subjective at this point. Okay. It is. If I can, <laughs> can I elaborate on that real quick? Um, so I can tell you that the discussions we've had in the fire service working group is that we don't know what the end state looks like. It was never the intention to force everybody into doing something they don't want to do. I think we all understand that at some point it's not going to make sense anymore and we'll reach kind of a point of stasis, and whether that's five, six, two agencies, ten in the county. Um, it's not written in there exactly what that looks like, but I think we all understand it it'll come to a point where uh, it, it just doesn't make sense to do any more consolidations or, or, or mergers. Okay. So let's move to the um, administration of the tax. Um, so I under we understand there'll be a citizen advisory committee. So who will serve on that and how will those folks be chosen? I just gave this at the, with Chief Gossner, we were talking about it right at the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber. Are you, is it off the top of your head? Uh, the, um, the Citizens Advise Oversight Committee. How will I they be chosen? Two, yeah, I believe it's two county, two mayors and council members, mm -hmm. and two fire chiefs. I think, okay, yes. We just, we just, we went through this presentation with the Santa Rosa Metro Chamber, but I couldn't remember that. I think that's right, right? So. Okay. 
so Andrea our, our city and our, or mm -hmm. our district may not have representation. Um, that so it would be up to the mayors and council members okay. to appoint the city um, representatives. And another thing that we've had conversations um, with Katadi and as Supervisor Gore mentioned, I mean, I certainly would. You know, we, there are still policies that we could pass at the county level to say mandate consultation or presentations, for instance, at a city council member before there are any adjustments, right, um, made to something that would impact your jurisdiction, right? So basically, like we would have to come up here and provide a presentation. Um, but the other thing is that when we're talking about, um, if you're thinking sort of about those potential for budget adjustments, um, is it also has to go through the Fire Chiefs Association before it gets to the Board of Supervisors. So just, yeah. And then just kind of to move over to the fuel load reductions, because that's a huge um, um, issue that and, and Linda and I work on that at the Air um, Pollution Control District. I'm just a little concerned because I'm wondering how you're going to plan to implement that fuel um, reduction plan when you yourself say over and over again that, you know, the issue with Sonoma County is it's so much of our, um, of our ag land or our open space, it's privately owned. So how do you actually plan to um, implement these, you know, you, you're, you've got a plan for getting the money, how are you actually going to do, perform fuel load reduction? Well, I think there's, you know, and, and I'll let Chief Boas after me, but there's two things. There's voluntary programs, and it goes back to carrot and stick. We all know that, right? So the voluntary programs that exist out there currently is our chipper program. And our chipper program and working with willing landowners, creating cope teams, uh, creating brushes, it's got like three times the demand that it did two years ago, which is a good thing. And those voluntary programs are nice. But we do have Rule 13A uh, in Sonoma mm -hmm. County Code. I brought it forward to the Board of Supervisors in my first year. It is a vegetation management abatement, hazardous fuel abatement ordinance. Um, ultimately, we put uh, $500,000 behind it uh, two years ago to move into primarily a couple, uh, a couple pilot areas. And initially, we had identified Fitch Mountain uh, and, a couple, and, and, and Camp Meeker, but there's some issues. We moved forward with... Fitch Mountain. Now, the current ordinance reads that it's only for uh, under five-acre properties. And, um, and I'll tell you, we're going to bring forward, and I'd like to maybe consult with the mayor and council members on this, too, is, is that I, um, my goal is to bring Rule 13A forward again to the Board of Supervisors this year because actually one of the biggest issues we face is not under five-acre parcels like in Fitch Mountain or just on McRae Road. It is the absentee landowners up in the hills. Um, it is folks who have, uh, whether they live, I say absentee in the sense of either they bought and they don't live here, or they live here and they don't have the ability to manage it. But there has to be property uh, uh, responsibilities with property rights. Um, what I was looking at doing was uh, potentially, and I talked with some of our uh, folks, is opening that up uh, to larger parcels and focusing on a few priority areas and identifying pilots that we would go into. One of them would for sure be uh, the Lake Sonoma watershed. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do know from assessments with Sonoma Water and others is that if we have a fire up in that area and we get all that active carbon into our water supply, it basically breaks down our natural filtration system. So um, I would just say, you know, that's one thing where big bad government dropping red tags out of a helicopter onto your property saying <laughs> you got to clean up your... Uh, your stuff, or we're going to have to come in and actually force it and abate it, and then and then charge you back, put a lien on your property. Um, I think uh, I, I, I think we need to step it up, but we need the boots on the ground to be able to do that work. Uh, most of that work right now is contracted out of the county into the individual fire districts mm -hmm. uh, to work on. Okay, and just to um, oh, go well, ahead, Chief. You. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. I just wanted to add to that. Um, again, talk about local control. Our, our intent is not to tell fire chiefs what to do with the money. The, the intent was, you know, bringing on boots on the ground, bringing on firefighters to the, ex to the extent that the chief uses them for vegetation management programs or chipping crews, that, that's going to be up to the discretion of the chief. Uh, I will tell you this, that there is, a, uh, w another thing that was identified in this plan is there is a, um, a fire prevention officer position that was appointed in each region. In this case, for region six, that position landed in the city of Hillsburg, and that was for a number of reasons I can elaborate on if you want, but my, my, the way I envision that position is it's, it's a regionally oriented position. So it, I'll, I will be having, hopefully, conversations with Chief Jenkins and Chief Turberville, and I envision that position as being somebody to help, for example, write grants, coordinate vegetation management crews, all that. But again, a lot of those details haven't been worked out, but there's enough discretion in there that uh, I think a, a 
chiefs can work together and, and work that out. for Because it's going to look different in different parts of the county. What we do in the North County is going to be different than what they do in the West County. And we tried to provide that flexibility in the plan. Yeah, I, I'm probably not going to get an answer on this tonight, but I'll, I must say that I'm a little concerned about the lack of performance matrix for consolidation. Um, I hear what you're saying is, you know, it's going to have to find its balance, but I'm a little concerned about a measure that doesn't really have a clear um, definition of that. Um, and then my other concern is that, you know, this is a two, per, this is a, a half percent um, tax in perpetuity. I don't think fire danger is going to go away. Climate change isn't going to go away. But I am concerned about um, a dedicated uh, tax revenue of this magnitude when we have so many other infrastructure issues that need to be addressed in North County. So uh, if you'd like to defend that, you're welcome to. But I'll just, I, I don't, it's not necessarily a question, yeah. but I, I have a, a major concern about that point. I want to start with, and well, you're going to do the same thing. I, I mean, I want to stress that it is not subjective to say that you're going to take consolidations through LAFCO, in my opinion. I mean, if uh, I've traveled the LAFCO process multiple times with multiple consolidations. Using LAFCO as a clearinghouse has actually been very effective for us in terms of uh, pushing consolidation. I actually have come from the opposite side, which is the... Um, the world where when the county and CSA 40 and what was used to be called Sonoma County Fire and Emergency Services attempts at consolidation were not only inept, but they were met with uh, more fire than was in the hills, right? And, uh, and quite honestly, it was because it was politics. It was because there wasn't staff in place, and I actually do not have confidence in I, my, my goal as a part of this with creating an independent entity and then have everything go through LAFCO was to get us out of that business. I don't want to decide where the money goes and have chiefs lobby from all of us in different areas. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. I think if, you, uh, if you're interested, and I could even uh, have a follow-up with this, is with Mark Bramp, the executive director of LAFCO, is uh, you know, what are the details around those MSRs and those SOIs that require you to look at a standard of coverage and prove that you have enough money to even fulfill your duty within that new jurisdiction that you're going to do? Because that's really what's coming before LAFCO right now is, is that there's a lot of people who want to consolidate but either the Board of Supervisors or City Councils or Special Districts or a sales tax has to supplement them because, unfortunately, we are far below a lever of coverage. So I think uh, something to dive into. I just wanted to sort of speak from the LAFCO perspective for those of you who aren't as familiar with the process, which is that first there's an MSR, which is a municipal services review, and that basically is sort of a SWOT analysis. Um, and basically it looks at, you know, is this district financially viable going forward, or would it make sense for it to partner with a neighbor or neighbors in order to sort of be more viable and more effective? Um, and so right now, actually, as we speak, we have the fire services working group working closely with, um, with LAFCO to actually cut up West County. Um, and it looks like, you know, one section is going to be going towards Sonoma County Fire District, um, led by Chief Hine, and the other is going to be sort of headed towards Goldridge. Um, and so basically, at that point, you know, in three years, we'll be looking at these individual districts and saying, are you making progress in going towards that regionalization and the, those spheres of influence that were drawn by LAFCO under really, you know, it's not, there's no sort of easy check the box or, you know, yes, no, or rubric or metric, but it is a very sort of systematic way of determining whether those services will be effective and sustainable in the future, or if there's a way to deliver those services to the public more effectively. And that's kind of the metric that will be used. So. Gus, I have, you have a question. Yeah. Council Member Brigham, yes. I'm talking about consolidation. I'm so happy to hear that. Um, Cloverdale is kind of unique in that we not only have the fire district located within our city limits, but we also have a CDF. That's, and our constituents here in Cloverdale have watched a uh, brand new fire station go up, and it's beautiful, and it's effective. They've also watched the new CDF fire station go up. And can you explain to the public why we aren't even considering consolidating CDFs and fire districts? Why? Well, I, I mean... I've been involved through the California State Association of Counties in some of these discussions with CAL FIRE and with, uh, and even the Forest Service on the different areas. And, and currently, I mean, 
Um, they play very well in the same sandbox when it's incident management time, right? When it's fire time and the mutual aid system is on the ground, like I was up with uh, some of our folks on the Hill, I mean, to say they play very well also means they don't play perfectly well together, right? So you get up there and you have the inmate crews, and then you have, uh, you have CDF, and then you have, uh, you have the hot shots from, uh, for, from uh, you know, U.S. Department of, of Ag Forestry Service, and you got others. And if you really start to kind of key in and listen to how these guys do their business, there are different rivalries and different things oh going boy, on. Oh, boy, howdy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, hot shots want to go be hot shots, right? You know, and, and then at the same time, I mean, I, I had an experience during the Kincaid fire where I was with uh, Chief Turbeville, and, uh, you know, listening in as there was even from incident command out of the state, and I'll say this for myself, I won't say it for anybody else, is there was folks put in charge of co making calls out who were, who were making errors in some of the things like, for instance, calling West Soda Rock, East Soda Rock, calling Alexander Valley Road, uh, Highway 128. And so what, you know, there you go. And so, I, I, you know, what it leads back to is, is, I guess, this idea, you know, for me, the way I've, because I've, I've asked the same kind of questions and there's no consolidation right now with the state. I mean, even the state has so, so many derivatives. I was up on the hill and I saw so many uh, fire engines from California Office of Emergency Services. I'm like, why does Cal OES have, have its own engines too? It's because they want their own engines to control as well. And um, I'll, I'll stop and see if you, if you have uh, uh, anything on that. Well, I'm just curious. That's in, that's what the public is seeing. Absolutely. And they're seeing not con consolidated efforts in that they're seeing infrastructure when we so badly need it, like the walkway along First Street Bridge, yeah. <laughs> anything yeah. like that. I yeah. mean, it's like infrastructure, it looks to the public as if we're wasting our money on infrastructure yeah. when we could be consolidating two, two different entities at least under the same roof. They don't even, they can be separate entities, but in Cloverdale is a perfect example where we've spent money on two different really nice fire places. Somebody says, and that fire, I appreciate that, that they're there. Absolutely. Uh, but that's the, what you're gonna face mm -hmm. in the North County when they're looking at these questions, is why are we spending all this money on infrastructure when we could be spending it on uh, less infrastructure and more <coughs> bodies? Well, and I think that's, the, 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 what we have to get out uh, in front of consistently with you and with others is that this really is for bodies, right? I mean, if you look at the expenditure plan, it's uptick in salary positions, and then it's uh, recruitment and retention, which deals with the underlying cause of how we do that. Um, I'll let you uh, step in. Yeah. Let, let me speak to this real quick. I think this may help. Um, when the fire district looked at replacing the fire station, um, you know, 10 years ago, we thought the same thing. So we thought, well, gosh, couldn't we I remember partner, that. Couldn't Very we partner yes. um, and build one regional kind of fire station. Mm -hmm. uh, we sought uh, a letter to Cal Fire at the state level, and they said, absolutely not. We have two core different missions. So <laughs> really, they have a mission to protect the, the wildland and the watershed, and we have the, the mission to protect the homes and EMS and that side of things. So we, there are two distinct missions, though they get blurred in the time of big disasters, we get on the same page and have the same focus in many times, but at the end of the day, we do have two very distinct different missions and how they operate are, are, are different. So I just wanna make sure that the taxpayers of Cloverdale area know that we wanted to reach out and try to build a unified station and the state wasn't interested in doing that at the time. It was, I remember that very clearly and it was very frustrating for a lot yeah. of the locals here and I think that's what's really frustrating to the public when you're trying to pass a half cent thing like this. Um, you have to be really clear in what you're trying to achieve. And every time, I, I mean, their heads are exploding when I go and talk about this to the public. And it's that, well, what more do you want from us? You know, here we have these two big new structures here in Cloverdale, and now you want more money? So I'm just. Same. Totally understand. I get it. And if there's more questions like that that you feel you need help, Boy, there's a lot send, of them, send them my yeah. way. I just have a, a couple of questions, and I'm going to open it up to the public. Um, so, if I'm understanding this correctly, uh, this half cent sales tax, James, is going to raise $51 million. Um, the $3 million that we get from TOT tax from the county now, that, will that go away or is that still going to be funded? Is this instead of or in, in addition to? There, this is all in addition. Uh, the county supervisors 
I mean, we've made a commitment all the way through that there's no, that, that, that this is not for backfill. But the reality is, is that we don't have much more to put on the table, <laughs> as you all know, right. with homelessness and with uh, our investments over the past couple of years and some other things. So, so but we're, we're holding strong to that. Uh, on roads, kind of similarly, what we did is we actually indexed our roads, general fund money, so that it goes up with cost of living. It goes up with our increases in our uh, property taxes. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, if, if I would say from the county perspective, the only area for property taxes that we still have left that people sometimes want us to divert is the biggest one, which is the roads funding, about $12 million a year. I, I, I just have to wonder, you know, with Katati having their own fire, fire parcel tax and, and Cloverdale, and plus this $51 million, how much do you think um, people spend on firefighting? I mean, I, I can't even imagine. This is $51 million, yeah. and then every little district has their own yeah. parcel tax. It, it must be a, a tremendous amount of money. And I, I look yeah. at this picture here. That's a good point. I look at this picture that's up here right now, and, you know, 200 more firefighters wouldn't have stopped this. Hmm? Yeah, you, you know, uh, if this program was in place then, yeah. that would still be the same outcome. Well, I mean, and, the only thing and, I would... James, yeah. I, you know, yeah. there's no answer to that. Well... I, I, well well, I mean, the only thing, I, I, I will answer that because, you know, I mean, I, I actually, what I saw in Hillsburg and in Windsor was that when firefighters were not evacuating people, they were able to do absolutely amazing things. Yep. They had capacity, they had engines, they were able to create fire breaks. Um, and I know what you're saying because these fires that we're facing are not, it's, it's almost... Um, deleterious to say to use the word firefighters and call them fires because you don't have earthquake fighters you don't have hurricane fighters you don't have tornado fires but you have firefighters but what we've seen in two of the last three years is a natural disaster a wind event that creates an ember cast an ember storm there's no wall of fire and you know that and I know that so it's really comes down to command and control and it shows why that whatever this is that we do has to be fully integrated with our ability to manage populations, evacuations, notifications, and other things because they can't do their work if they're evacuating people. Yeah, yeah it, it's just more or less an observation. So with that being said, I want to bring it to our student liaison and our police chief if they have any questions. Otherwise, I'm going to open it to the public. Chief, are you uh, okay with everything? Yeah. Um, Ashton? Okay. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the public. If you'd like to comment or ask any questions of the supervisors, uh, please come up to the, to the podium and ask your questions. Come on up, bro. Yeah, my name is Rob Kozlowski, a resident here of uh, Cloverdale, formerly of Santa Rosa. And thanks for your presentation, uh, James, James, and Linda. I uh, really appreciate it. The one thing I would have liked to have seen in the presentation is the tie-ins to um, how does the Sonoma County Fire Agencies work with CAL FIRE. I would like to see more, more on that. I'd also like to see how does um, the firefighting organizations or the county folks work with PG&E on the vegetation management? I mean, in terms of is it done in isolation? Maybe in the hills you insulate the wires as they've been replacing them. And as I've gone back and forth to the grandkids in Ukiah, I've seen a lot of PG&E crews doing something out in the hills. Not sure what. Uh, and then thirdly, in terms of partnering with, um, I'm not sure, but the firefighters must have communications uh, when there's crisis events. And they might be using some of the AT&T, Verizon infrastructure. The third piece would have been, how does the firefighters... Um, coordinate or collaborate with the telecoms, especially in a natural disaster like these fires have brought, and support, you know, battery backup of towers to keep them and uh, the public, um, you know, in, in the know when you need to get the information out. Those are my questions. Rob, would you like to share with, uh, with the supervisors how you got to become a Cloverdalian? Oh, yeah. We lost our home in the Tubbs fire. We were evacuated at uh, 3 in the morning by the police officers because I think the firefighters were too busy near Calistoga. I don't know. I'd have to talk mm -hmm. with... Chief um, Jenkins. You, your team was out there as well, right, back in the day. So, um, so we relocated here. It was easier to relocate and build new here than in Santa Rosa. Um, that's our experience as a family. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Yes, if you'd like, Linda. 
You know, I just want to acknowledge sort of the statement that you had made um, with respect to, you know, would it have stopped that? And there, there's no way to no. say that it would have. Um, but the fact is, is that right now we are not meeting NFPA standards and that 200 more people will get us, you know, to that standard of coverage where there could be an instance where it actually does make that difference between something small not becoming a massive conflagration. And um, to the gentleman's point who spoke before me, in terms of integrating with CAL FIRE, what I have heard over and over again from the local chiefs is how critical every single local boot on the ground was during the Kincaid. Um, because at the end of the day, some state agencies don't know Casadero from Coalinga, right, which is in the Central Valley, the place where there are lots of cows and it smells really bad. They're very different from Casadero, um, you know, in, in many ways. And so I think that honestly having 200 more folks to deal with a major incident and to work in partnership with CAL FIRE, we are never going to employ year-round the thousands of people that it takes to fight these major events. We just aren't. But can we get there quicker to maybe stop an event from getting out of hand? Yeah. And can we also really inform that work during a major incident? Um, absolutely. And so I think that that's an opportunity for the really local fire districts to work together hand in glove with CAL FIRE. Thank you. Anyone else from the public that would like to ask a question? Okay, seeing no one, I'm going to bring it back to the dais to see if there's any more questions. And with the permission of, are there any more questions from the council? Well, then, uh, with your permission, council members, I'd like to direct staff to, um, and David, you and I had spoken about this. There's a few ballot initiatives coming up here in March. And I'd, I'd kind of like to have them presented at the next city council meeting for us to make a decision on, as a city council, do we want to support them or not? Um, James, I don't think we're ready to make a recommendation here this evening. Didn't anticipate uh, you would. I appreciate your time. Yeah, there's a lot to digest here. Yeah. I'd also like to know how many cities uh, um, within Sonoma County have supported this initiative, Absolutely. you know? Well, and I think, um, I think that's the process right now. There's, uh, right now all the presentations are being made. Yeah, as of now, um, the city of Santa Rosa supported it, uh, the city of Hillsburg supported it also. Okay. Well, Actually, uh, the next city, Hillsburg City Council member would be a, re a resolution in support. Okay. Yeah, don't have that in the minutes. Don't get ahead of your council, right? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 uh, you know, and Windsor as well. Um, I think the only thing, um, um, you know, for me is, uh, is just a last, uh, just a f final comment is appreciate your time. Um, as always, if you all, I notice the subcommittees and the other things on the agenda, if you all in any way want me to come back with members of the county family, planning, uh, transportation, public works, you got a great person there who lives here and does it, and walk through some of the projects, or if you want us to work through your subcommittees to address all these different issues, you let us know, uh, whatever it is. If we need to, if I need to be a part of hosting another forum like uh, we've talked about uh, on other issues or this, let me know. Uh, lots going on on homelessness and, uh, you know, that, and you have a lot of issues here. And, um, I mean, for this, um, the county, you know, there's no backfill to the county, and I don't get any employees out of this. So, I mean, the reason that I endorse it and I didn't write it because I wasn't on the ad hoc is because of, uh, is because I'm going to vote for it as a taxpayer. So, uh, uh, my, my love to all of you and uh, your decision-making process and respect. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Supervisor Hopkins, thank you for coming all the way up to Cloverdale with your staff, and I uh, appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Okay, why don't we go ahead and move on to student liaison reports. Uh, all right, uh, so the first uh, item I would like to report on is uh, the Mr. Eagle pageant, for any of you who know it, that our high school hosts every year. And what it is, it's, it's kind of a... I don't want to say a knockoff, but it's kind of another version of the Citrus Fair Queen pageant where a bunch of boys come up on stage and do a bunch of dumb stuff. And so I think, uh, it, well, that's what I've heard. And so I thought uh, for any of you who like to watch that kind of thing, I, you, I think it would be nice for you to go and support our students. Uh, also, the, our school's winter ball is on uh, February 12th, if anyone would like to go. And uh, this year, I, I know... A lot of submissions are made every year, and specifically this year for the Citrus Fair, uh, many students are going to be, uh, there are going to be many student volunteers as well as uh, students from our photography class that will be entering photos in the Citrus Fair. So if any of you would like to go and support their work. Thank you. Council members, any questions? Just a comment. You're doing a fantastic job of being our student liaison this 
here and I want to applaud you for that. It's not easy to come up here and talk, room full of people, you know you're on YouTube. Give yourself a pat on the back, you're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is the consent calendar and I'm going to pull item number five and we're going to do a separate vote on that so Councilmember Cruz can recuse herself from the vote. So would somebody like to offer the consent calendar for items number three, four, and six? So moved. I'll second. Can we have a roll call, Irene? Council Member Cruz? Aye. Vice Mayor Turner? Aye. Council Member Bagby? Aye. Council Member Brigham? Aye. And Mayor Walter? Aye. Next is, uh, can I have a motion on item number five? I'll move item number five. I will second. Can we have a roll call excluding Council Member Cruz? Vice Mayor Turner? Aye. Council Member Bagby? Aye. Council Member Brigham? Aye. Mayor Walter? Aye. Thank you. Okay, the next item is uh, communications. There are none, but now we're going to actually bring item number, number seven. Uh, I'm sorry, number eight. We're going to do that first, and that is um, the Sonoma County Energy Independence Program. And David, is that yours to introduce? Yes. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. I'd like to welcome Jane Elias uh, to the speaker desk this evening. Uh, Ms. Elias is going to provide a presentation on an amendment to the Sonoma County Energy Independence Program, which is part of a uh, property assessed clean energy financing program that was established uh, by the Board of Supervisors and subsequently supported by the Cloverdale City Council as well as uh, all other city councils in Sonoma County. Um, the, the county has went through a process, and I know Jane's going to talk about this, to uh, add some important components to this project. And what we're asking tonight is for uh, Council's consideration of a resolution that would approve an amendment to the agreement uh, based on the changes to the program. Uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll just turn over to Jane, and she'll give you a, a really a comprehensive overview of the proposed changes and amendments to the Skype program, as we refer to it. Jane. Thank you, David. Good evening, Mayor Walter and uh, council members. I'm Jane Elias. I'm the Energy and Sustainability Division Manager for the County of Sonoma. Uh, not, uh, BC Caps is, is not with me tonight, so uh, you just got me. But um, thank you for the opportunity tonight to talk with you about the Energy Independence Program. It's one of the services that the division has offered uh, for almost 11 years now here in the county along with many other services where we really focus around building improvements, uh, green business certifications, and other details. But the, the financing program, as David mentioned, is a property assessed clean energy program that provides financing for property owners, both residential and commercial. And that's commercial business owners that uh, include multifamily, uh, industrial, and agriculture, as well as just commercial. Um, we've been around for about 10 and a half years providing the financing and really the, the reason why we started it back in 2009 is we had a comprehensive energy uh, and climate plan put in place, a community climate plan, and really wanted to provide a financing option for property owners to be able to tackle doing some of these retrofit projects on their existing buildings to make them more energy efficient. Uh, provide water conservation measures, and then also for generation or solar improvements. How that's done is that property owners have a fairly easy application process through our program, and then ultimately, uh, as it says in the slide here, we have terms of 10 and 20 years that people pay that back through their property tax bill. So it becomes a line item assessment on their tax bill that they pay back over time, twice a year, just as they do with their regular tax payments. We have a fixed 7% interest rate. That has actually been the same for both residential and commercial for the lifetime of the program. But it is something that we do look at every year and evaluate uh, every September as to whether or not we adjust that interest rate. And a little bit of background about that, um, since some of you may have questions as to why that, that interest rate was determined. It is, uh, this program uses absolutely no county general funds. It is self-sustaining. 
just by having people utilize the financing. And the 7% interest rate that we charge, uh, that people pay back, 3% of that goes to the county treasury for their investment of purchasing the bonds that are created from the program. And the other 4% is what covers the entire, entire administrative costs, um, all the staffing, marketing, administrative details, what have you, um, to make that self-sustaining. We have originally focused specifically just on energy efficiency, water, and generation. And before you tonight, uh, we are looking at expanding it for seismic and for wildfire safety. Um, our eligibility criteria is pretty straightforward. We really look at it more so as the property and not the individual. So um, as it's noted in the fourth bullet there, we don't look at income credit and verification on the individual and pull credit reports and look at credit scores. We're really looking to make sure that everybody who is applying, has, if they have liens, they're current on those existing liens, and we go back three years on their property taxes to also make sure that they're current and that there are no uh, defaults or uh, delinquencies. A little bit of detail, uh, just some program stats. On the left-hand side, you've got a table of the total number of projects that we have financed over the, the lifetime as well as the dollars, uh, it's a little over 83 million total um, for you know, about 2,600 uh, projects. On the right, we do have some stats there for Cloverdale, which while they seem small, they are not insignificant whatsoever. Um, ultimately, my goal would be to try and uh, get some commercial projects here in the town, would be great. Um, but this, the financing really, uh, as we've seen here in the county and I think throughout the rest of the state, has primarily focused in residential. While it shows 2% of the uh, total funded projects in the county have been done here in Cloverdale, that really is uh, synonymous with the total overall population of the county, which when we look at about 500,000 and, and you look at the residents of Cloverdale, of about you know, 8,500, 8,700, whatever it is, you know, it's about a 1.7% of the total population. So that's right in line, and we really see that consistently uh, throughout all of the jurisdictions. So how does the program work? Well, um, like I mentioned before, it's pretty straightforward. The, the workflow is the property owners are identifying what kind of improvements they want to make to their properties. Uh, they typically go forward and when they apply, they've got to turn in their proposal or their bid of what kind of work they want to do. Um, local contractors provide those bids and that said, it, we also entertain out, out of the county contractors. But one of the, the really proud statistics that I have uh, is that over 90% of the projects we have financed have been by local contractors here in the county. They uh, go ahead and apply. They work with the staff here uh, in my office. And then uh, we also offer no-cost consultations if people are wanting to just really look at uh, the um, process of reduce before you produce. We always try and encourage people do energy efficiency projects before they do solar to try and bring down their, their usage. Therefore, hopefully uh, having lower uh, or less um, solar on their, their house or a building. And uh, we also will you know, give them free solar consultations uh, as well as retrofit consultations. We've added wildfire safety and, and resiliency consultations uh, for people looking to do the types of improvements and figure out what they want to do to those buildings. And then uh, once they're approved um, and those improvements are completed, they turn in their final paperwork and we disperse that financing at that time and then it is put on their next tax bill uh, moving forward. It is a lien that we do place uh, once they are approved and their contracts are signed. We do uh, record a lien on the property, and then, um, like I said, the disbursement happens at the end of the project with the total financing. So moving forward, why we're looking at seismic and wildfire safety, um, since the Assembly Bill 811 was passed in 2008, allowing for the PACE financing. I think it's been amended about 12 times. Um, the seismic strengthening, Assembly Bill 184, actually was amended in 2011. We never entertained it up until this, uh, this last year. 
just simply because there didn't seem to be too much of an appetite uh, for adding seismic to our program. But then in 2018, when the wildfire safety elements were added, we looked at that and the board really wanted to go ahead and offer both of those types of improvements because, as we all know, uh, with wildfire and floods, um, we kind of can expect those. They're a little bit more consistent, unfortunately, and for seismic, we never know when it's going to happen, and all it's going to take is one event. So when the board went ahead and approved the expansion in July 2019, we added both of those to the program. We also then entertained doing the judicial validation action. It's an expensive process. It's a lengthy one. It took us about five months to do it, and we figured we may as well throw seismic in there at the same time so we didn't have to do this again, hopefully. <laughs> Um, that validation action just finished in December, and then there was a 30-day waiting period. Um, fortunately, we had absolutely no opposition throughout the entire process. And then, just as last week, uh, that was fully authorized, and we can now offer seismic and wildfire in the unincorporated area. And then here tonight to just talk with you about bringing forward um, these improvements in your jurisdiction so that your property owners can take uh, advantage of these. This is just an example of a few of the improvements that we uh, can offer, and I think in your packets you did have a, a two-page form that had a little bit more detail about that, and I do have some additional ones that I can put on the counter out there in the lobby uh, for anybody in the audience that's interested. Um, while we have been able to finance for roofing and siding and windows, that was always around energy efficiency. By adding it with wildfire safety, uh, you can certainly make it energy efficient. We hope you will. And some of that does have the requirements, but all we are really requiring is that it be non-combustible material, uh, ember resistant, ignition resistant details. Um, so while we had the uh, U-factor and solar heat, heat gain coefficient of windows, you now have to add a tempered glass pane to make that um, uh, really look for, for wildfire safety. Um, for the seismic strengthening, you know, you're really looking at the bracing and bolting, the uh, foundation structural connections, anchoring, and some soils uh, evaluation and treatment. So uh, here tonight, um, just to uh, look at what needs to happen is if uh, you so choose to move forward with this, it would be an amendment to the cooperative agreement that we had with you uh, back in 2009 to add seismic and wildfire and then to pass a resolution authorizing the expansion for your property owners. And I'm here to answer any questions you may have. And thank you. Jane, thank you. Uh, council members, Marianne, I'm going to start with you and work our way to the right. Anything? Actually, I do. I had uh, someone call me actually this morning about this. Um, is there going to be a possibility, this happens to be a person that has a lot of trees on their property, and some of them are right up against her house, and right. And I made the suggestion when I was over there, I said, geez, I'd cut those branches off, that's like, go right up through. Mm -hmm. um, but of course she can't afford that, because it's like probably $10,000 worth of just cutting trees down and away from the house. Is there any chance that kind of thing's gonna be covered under this category now, or is that a no? I can tell by your face, it's, it's a no. <laughs> not necessarily. Uh, the financing allows only for permanently installed improvements That's what I thought, yeah. on the building. Mm. Uh, that said, the wildfire safety legislation uh, was pretty explicit as far as what kinds of improvements and while we can now offer replacement or new decks that are ember resistant or ignition resistant. We are also allowed to do hardscaping of the first five feet from the building out. If that includes a tree in that five feet, there's a possibility okay. that- Okay, it's branches of the tree are actually on the house almost. The tree itself is probably 10 feet away, especially the two that scare me that are there. Right. So, so that it touches the house. Yeah. And but unfortunately, no, okay. that wouldn't, it's, it's the, the, the first five feet as, as the legislation dictates, and really that's the most critical, is that first five, and then you go out 30, and then it's out to 100. Um, you know, short of 
something being amended in that legislation, we really can only look at the first five feet. That said... I'm sorry to hear that, because yeah. there's a lot of that that needs to be done, especially in Cloverdale. There is a lot of vegetation management. And that said, one of the reasons you know, the board did this back in July is because they did also uh, apply for a FEMA grant for vegetation management. Mm -hmm. We are still waiting for the word from FEMA as to whether or not the county is going to get that grant but um, it is something that certainly to keep an eye on because when that does happen, people will be able to apply for that and they are talking about $10,000 that property owners will be able to get towards the vegetation management and with that, there's a 25% match that they have to do. The financing can come in with that and can offer that 25% match that's required. That would be huge for a lot of the property owners I know in a lot of the neighborhoods, but... Um, tree removal. It's expensive. It's expensive, it's, and it's yeah. just, I, I was shocked when yeah. she showed me the bids. I said, whoa. Yeah. But it, it seems logical if you're going to try and stop fire, you've got to stop the branches from going up their eaves. Absolutely. We, you will let us know if that happens? You bet. Thank you. You bet. And, you know, as far as the eaves, I mean, we can do the roofing. We can do the vents, the soffit vents, the eave vents. You know, that those can all great. become fire, it's fireproofed. Just the trees themselves. Yeah. She doesn't want to cut them down, but she's going to have to. Yeah. Save that house. Councilmember Bagby. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Turner. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Councilmember Cruz. Yes, I do have a question uh, because we own. Uh, a condo in a multi-unit, how can we as individuals or anybody else who lives in a condo take advantage of this program? Because right now it just seems like it's for individual homes, houses. It does, uh, it does allow for condominiums or townhouses. You obviously have to work with your homeowners association or any CCNRs that you've got. Uh, so depending upon what kinds of improvements you're wanting to finance, if it's exterior and they've got, they dictate what that looks like, we do require that that HOA letter or something be turned in with the application showing that it's been approved. But if you have a roof line that you're sharing with another one next door and you're wanting to do something you know, to the roof, uh, oftentimes you know, that gets a little sticky. Uh, we have had property management companies and owners that have common areas of, of complexes like that that want to improve those. Um, but we have certainly financed HVAC, heat pumps, high-efficiency furnaces, water heating, uh, insulation. Those types of improvements we can absolutely do with townhouses and condos. But when you get to the exterior piece of it where you have to work with your HOA, it's oftentimes dictated yeah, by them. It's just that I didn't see it here. So, I was, yeah. Just a clarifying question on that. I'll give it right back to Martin. Could the entity as a whole com approach you as a commercial investment? Yes, but if the units are owned by Individual. individuals, okay. then it would actually you have, have to be, to the you'd have all so property owners that would have to. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's just that, you know, I've read all this and I'm all for it. However, mm -hmm. I didn't see that aspect for multi units. Thank you. Some of the improvements we can do. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jane, I just have two questions, um, and, and you already answered them for me prior to the meeting, but I just want to get them out there. Um, is this a credit bureau event for the individual, or does it not appear on their credit bureau report? It does not appear on their credit bureau. Uh, we, we do not, uh, our program, the Sonoma County Energy Independence Program, is considered a municipal pace program. We do not pull credit reports or look at credit scores. That is not true of other PACE providers that are operating in the county that are third-party for-profit. They do actually pull credit reports, and that's part of their qualifying criteria. How, how do you determine the top dollar amount that an individual is available? When they first come in to apply, we pull an automated valuation model to look at the market value, the current market value at the time. Um, that said, it works for probably 90% plus. We can also accept a full appraisal. Or we do have a broker's price opinion that we'll accept as well. For properties that are valued over one and a half million, the AVM doesn't work, so we either go to an appraisal or a BPO. Once that market value is established, they can finance up to 10% of that market value. Okay. Regardless of indebtedness already on it? 
the, we could finance the up to 10% to of it, so let's say it's 600,000, we can finance up to 60,000. Then we look at the liens, if there are any liens, and we look at what the, va the value is that they still owe of the lien, as well as what they're wanting to finance. Those com combined cannot exceed 100% of the market value, so we don't want them to be underwater. And is there any um, ramifications from Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac? Yes. But there are. There, so back 2010 when the county <clears throat> and the state sued uh, the FHFA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, that went on for about four years. Uh, basically, all of those disclosures are in our application. Essentially, what it says is at the time you sell or if you refinance, if you are working with a conforming loan of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, you may be forced to pay off the assessment at that point. That said, it's, you know, if you're selling, it's a negotiation between the buyer and seller. Um, sometimes it involves the buyer's lender. But uh, if you're refinancing, it's, it's really working through that lender and, and what the details are. Thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. I'm going to open it up to the public. Anyone wishing to come up and uh, ask Jane some questions, please do so. Okay, seeing no one, we'll bring it back to the dais one more time. And we're looking good. And Jane, thank you so much. Uh, you do a wonderful job there, and thank you for keeping Cloverdale informed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, I'm going to move up item number. Um, Are we going to vote on the resolution? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, Ahead of myself here. I'm being rushed to get through this meeting. So there's, there's two. It would be a good idea to vote, though. There's two, res <laughs> there's two resolutions um, one on page 111 and the other one on page um, 109. So I'd like somebody... to recommend the um, attachment one mm -hmm. uh, resolution of the city, of, the city council of the city of Cloverdale approving amendment number one to the cooperative agreement to implement the Sonoma County Energy Independence Program with the County of Sonoma to allow property owners within the incorporated area of the city to finance seismic strengthening improvements and wildfire safety improvements through the use of contractual assessments provided by the Sonoma County Energy Independence Program. Second. Second by uh, Brigham. Can we have a roll call? Council Member Bagby. Aye. Council Member Brigham. Aye. Council Member Cruz. Aye. Vice Mayor Turner. Aye. And Mayor Walter. Aye. Resolution uh, number two attached to this is on page 111. I may recommend. Ma um, Ma Mayor Council, I think the action taken to adopt the resolution or is, that all the, is all the action that the council needs to oh, take tonight. Right. Okay. I uh, saw one for the city and one for the county. <coughs> there we go. Okay. The, both of those are amendments uh, to the existing agreements. And w by adopting a resolution, you are approving the amendments. Thank you. Um, I'd like to move the skateboard park up. I see a lot of youngsters, uh, uh, young adults, some youths in the audience, and I know you got school tomorrow, and even I get glazed over here once in a while, so why don't we take that item next if we could? Yeah, thanks, sir. And, and I think there's a recusement there. I Thank need you. to recuse myself, too. And just for the record, uh, both recusals um, are related to a property interest. Um, close to the property, the Times Square property. <clears throat> Mayor, council members, uh, this is the proposed adoption of the conceptual design for the skate park slated for Times Square parcel C. Uh, attached in your agenda report is are both the conceptual uh, drawings, about five or six different uh, iterations of that, as well as a preliminary budget. Uh, this design really reflects the input from two separate workshops that we had with the assistance of the uh, design team at Spawn Ranch, uh, the city's consultant. Um, it also takes into account the shape, the kind of the odd shape of the parcel, the easements uh, that go across the parcel, which had to kind of we had to stay out of, um, and the size of the lot. So, I think that the ultimate design was. Uh, ended up with a lot of the features that were that was asked for during the workshops and I would like to go into some of those features I don't really know what they are I'm not a skater but maybe somebody from the audience could elaborate on those uh, the, the budget that was included is 428,000 of course that doesn't include the frontage improvements the curb gutter sidewalk of course there's no street out in front of the of the parcel at this point at this time also fencing and lighting if, if that's where the way we go um, we did propose in the staff report that we could come back with a financing plan for consideration by the council. 
um, if that plan makes sense, then we can start incorporating that into the budget discussion that we're going to start having this spring, if that's the direction of the council. So really our, uh, our recommendation tonight is that you approve by motion the conceptual design uh, for the skate park. And again, we're looking uh, for direction on the next steps if you'd like us to start putting together some kind of financing plan. Thank you. Um, before I open it up to the public council members, anything? I have a question for staff. Uh, as far, I don't, we may not be that far yet, uh, but as part of the conceptual design, is there any information on um, the uh, temperature variation that can that will happen with the skate park, um, given Cloverdale's extreme temperatures and how it's going to affect the, the neighboring properties? We, we have not uh, provided any an analysis of that. Uh, that could potentially could be covered in a in a CEQA document if we end up doing a, a CEQA, unless it's exempt from CEQA, but. There's, there was some discussion of trees around the park, but I mean, it, the, the consensus was that it really isn't a good idea to have trees near a skate park because of things falling into the park, into the actual park itself. So it's a matter of uh, debris and, and branches, leaves falling in and maintenance. And then um, just to, to follow up too, is there, um, where are we as far as, um, the working with the school board and with some of their concerns and then also the citrus fair um, on this particular location and I and I'll, I'll, I'll um, lead you to where I'm going which is you know when this was originally um, um, conceptualized it was not adjacent to uh, the middle school and that of course changed with um, with Alexander Valley Healthcare, so I'm just wondering, you know, where those parties are now, and if their concerns have been addressed for um, um, any nuisance concerns or, you know, um, shared um, improvements. Just, you know, where are we with those two adjacent um, property owners? Great, great question, Councilmember Bagby. Uh, the staff at this point uh, has not done additional consultation with either the Citrus Fair or, or the school board. Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that uh, I, th I think this council, as, as part of the joint workshop, discussed. And I, one of the elements that I think was uh, part of that conversation were a lot of the actually kind of the finer design elements that we don't have at this point relative to um, the issues of, 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 uh, of fencing, lighting, uh, how the adjacency with the skate park would tie in to the plans for the uh, improvements that are proposed at the middle school. Uh, so really what we wanted to bring forward is, is at this point, a, a conceptual design and to see if there is you know, support for this concept and to get your direction on next steps, which could be let's, let's do additional consultation with, with the school board. Uh, and or the Citrus Fair. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what we've heard at least from the Citrus Fair uh, is, is really uh, just a general level of, of, of uh, support, but you know, there hasn't been a, a lot of discussion about the design elements that were uh, provided for in this conceptual plan. Uh, the majority of the conversation has been with uh, specific members of the board through the Joint City School subcommittee uh, about how this project would interface with the, the adjoining school property. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't include all the other elements that I think the, this, the council and the school board discussed in the workshop around uh, uh, fencing, lighting, landscaping, um, and how, that would, how those would interface with the projects that uh, the, the school district is, is proposing in terms of uh, the um, a new gymnasium, um, <clears throat> kind of a it, it, staff's interpretation of one of the issues that was addressed was about the location, and 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 should should the council consider an alternative location, uh, and so that that's part of your discussion tonight is. Uh, reaffirming whether you, 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 you like the design and, and how it's proposed in its current location. 
um, obviously uh, this design is based on the kind of the actual site. If 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 council decides that um, you know an alternative location is is more, uh, you know, we should evaluate. Obviously, we will need to kind of go back and and really relook at that. Uh, we we, we, we uh, as I think Councilmember Bagby you alluded, uh, the the skate park was always identified on the Times Square property. Uh, as we went through the development process, uh, a, a design process, excuse me, with the um, parcel map um, and really started doing the more detailed engineering analysis that was necessary, uh, the alignment of the extension of Washington Street uh, kind of drove how and where the skate park would be located. Uh, but obviously, uh, uh, if this isn't a suitable site uh, because of concerns expressed by the school district, then you know we'll have to we'll have to you know, we'll, we'll take that feedback and and have to bring back uh, something that would you know meet with your meet with your approval as well as the school district's approval. Councilmember Turner, uh, no, no specific questions at this time. You know, I'm of the opinion that. Um, I, realistically, um, what's our best guess for the Alexander Valley Wellness Center to stop breaking ground there? And um, by the time that happens, um, you know, who knows what's going to happen with that property? Uh, I, the school uh, uh, district has to make some arrangement for the drainage. I, and, and until all of that is laid out, I'm not so sure that... Um, that we should be spending any more money on this project right now. Um, the location, as far as I'm concerned, is fine. I hear the concerns from the school board and the school district. You know, uh, the bottom line is nobody wants it in their neighborhood. And, and I understand because of the new gymnasium um, that it wouldn't probably blend properly w with, with the school property. By the same token, um, you know, we've been working with this um, uh, skateboard park for quite a while. We've all agreed that this was going to be the location. Uh, my concern is, though, we're not going to start on this project tomorrow until the street is put in and Alexander Valley uh, Wellness actually has started to move some dirt there. Am I correct? That's correct. Yeah. So, I mean, we could be talking three or four years before that happens. Well, Mayor, if I can, just to uh, maybe provide some thoughts for the council's consideration. Um, it, it, it's, it's really at your discretion about how you may want to see this project move forward. We certainly could uh, wait for Alexander Valley Wellness to construct the necessary site improvements on their parcel that they're looking at, and which is really currently the city's parcel. Uh, but if the council so desired uh, and provided direction to staff, there would be an opportunity to uh, construct the frontage improvements and build the skate park as a standalone improvement, uh, irrespective of what is occurring on the adjacent parcel. We looked at it from the perspective that it would be integrated with what's been proposed and sequenced accordingly, uh, but given the parcel map that has been approved and recorded, you know, it does identify the area. Uh, there's nothing necessarily stopping the council from saying, we want this project to proceed. Or what we would be doing then is developing the engineer's design work to have all the frontage improvements that would be necessary to support its use as a skate park. Uh, part of what we're relying on here is uh, uh, some of those improvements, particularly on the uh, east side of proposed extension of, of, of Washington Street, to be improved by the proposed developer. In terms of timing, I just wanted to reiterate that um, the environmental document for that project is currently under, uh, is out for public review and comment, and that's going to be closing here shortly. Uh, the um, you know, the project proponents for that project have at least indicated to staff that they're eager to see that move forward. And as a city manager under under 
the authority provided by the city council did uh, just last week uh, execute an updated purchase and sale agreement in which they had indicated they were very strongly interested in continuing. Uh, and so uh, that was uh, at least a signal to, to me that they're, they're interested in moving forward. Have we had a conversation with the school district as far as what their plans are for that gymnasium? I don't believe there's an architectural plan yet. Is there? Have, have we seen it, uh, Todd? Has Okay. Okay. And Mayor, we, and, and that design has not been provided to city staff yeah. and okay. uh, for review and comment. Uh, and, and the school district's not obligated to seek our approval specifically relative to the architecture and the, uh, well, the design. Well, I understand that, but right. there's a drainage issue there. Right. And, and I'd hate to see us invest this type of money in a project only to have it ripped up so that the drainage could be addressed. So with that being said, I'd like to... Yeah, Mr. Mayor, actually, yes. but I'm really interested in, uh, as well as hearing from the, the school board, I'd like to hear from the skaters as to it, just the, the concept of this design and if it would suit their needs, uh, if it's age appropriate, if they're concerned about, um, you know, summer temperatures, things like that. So just, that's, I'd like to just generally hear their, um, their review of the, of the project so that independent of where it might be located because we're committed to, to doing a skate park. That's not the issue. Um, but there have been some issues with this location that, that have come up. So I guess I'm more interested in hearing with, if the feature set is going to you know, suit the, um, the, gotcha. the, the people who are going to be using it. That's okay. what I'm interested in hearing about tonight. Yep. Let's open it up to the public and um, it, it, feel free to come up and say a few words if, 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 if you think this is a good plan for a skateboard park. Does it fit all the needs that you, that you might need? And as Council Member Bagby said, let's not even consider right now uh, an issue that we may have with the school district, is this going to fit your needs, is what we're looking for. Mr. Mayor, members Sorry, of council, quick, city Sean, staff. Sean, yes, sir. Quick, can we move this, please? Yeah. Oh, yes. oh that's over. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Sean, we can listen. Okay. City staff, Chief Ferguson, thank you, uh, thank you all very much for your time. Uh, thank you, David. I, uh, I jumped at uh, the opportunity, I wasn't sure any of these uh, young men were going to, uh, to give you kind of some idea to um, answer Council Member Bagby's question. Um, before I do, though, um, if I could just take a moment to express my appreciation for the, the folks that have come out. Um, they waited a long time to, uh, to stay and just remain in those seats and remain supportive of the project. Um, as Mr. Rez, Mayor Walter had uh, indicated himself, sometimes it's, it's hard to stay there and, and stay put. So, thank you. You guys did a great job. Thank you. you behaved yourselves very well. So. Uh, we've had several workshops, uh, a number of ad hocs. Um, this process in, uh, in terms of coming up with a conceptual design that worked for, uh, for our, our youth um, had, had gone through quite an extensive process. Um, we had folks that were uh, adults, such as myself, all the way down to very little kids. Uh, we talked about uh, scooters in the park. We talked about bicycles. Uh, effectively, um, they ran the, uh, those meetings. Uh, Mr. Thompson uh, was, of course, um, uh, in charge of the most of them, uh, did a great job of organizing people and making sure they were aware and getting them in attendance. Um, so uh, effectively, uh, yeah, a, a lot of work, a lot of time did go into talking to the kids in the community about what they wanted and whether this would suit their needs. Um, of course, I would agree with you, Mr. Mayor, that um, we may still be a little bit uh, cart before the horse. Um, I, I know that it's imperative that, um, that we respect the school board and, and their opinion of the project, and we work together. Um, at, at this time, I certainly don't want to see us going backward. Um, I, I can recall being up at this podium uh, when uh, Mr. Cox was mayor 
and uh, we were talking about this very same project. Um, we've bounced all over Cloverdale. We've worked closely with city engineers, city staff, in determining an appropriate location that was safe, easily accessible, and appropriate for our, our, our community. Um, so I certainly don't want to see us go backward. Uh, Mr. Mayor, too, thank you for acknowledging that we have spent a considerable amount of money here under Quimby Act funds at $13,000. That is the first time in the history of Cloverdale and the conversation surrounding the skate park that we've made this kind of progress. So we certainly don't want to have to um, entertain the idea of another location. Unfortunately, I, I would tend to agree that it is a, a question of not in my backyard. Um, I, I know that we need to work together. I, we had the workshop where we all were in attendance. The board from the school was also in attendance. Um, I, I'd like to see that collective collaborative effort continue. Um, unfortunately, I attended a, a planning and um, uh, subcommittee for uh, planning and development on December 17th. I didn't see anybody from the school board at that meeting. I haven't seen anybody from the school board at any of our workshops, so I'm not exactly sure how we bridge the gap. How do we get the school board involved to iron out whatever their issues are, uh, assuming that, of course, it's not just a matter of not in my backyard. Uh, in, a, in respect to the temperatures, um, yeah, we, we did identify the trees and the debris can cause some issue there with the skaters and things um, and safety. Uh, respective of the idea that we work together on a larger plan with Alexander Valley and things, I, I think the trees are an awesome option. Um, just appropriately placed, you know, landscaping to provide that sort of, uh, of level of comfort uh, as well as to limit the distraction to kids over at Washington School. So we are very open to the idea of, of fencing um, any way that we can help address their concerns. But again, I just don't want to see us get into a position of not in my backyard. We've been doing that now for 15 years. Yeah. We were at Ferber Park. I mean, we've been everywhere. So again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, yeah. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, we've been involved with this uh, uh, for at least the last 10, 12 years. So please, if you have any questions. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, Sean. And, and uh, as uh, Council Member Bagme uh, reminded me, we're, we're here for the design, not for the location. Anyone else want to address this? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay, uh, Sean. Uh, can you come on back down, Sean, please? Um, so to stay focused on design. Oh, yes, sir. Please. Of course. You seem to be the spokesperson for the group. You've been at the uh, different subcommittees. Okay, I've, I've overspoke there. You are uh, speaking on behalf of the collective quite regularly in my experience. So I'd like to ask you some questions that you can either answer on behalf of yourself or choose to answer on behalf of the collective. You got Is it. Is there enough amenities for individuals who want to skateboard at different levels, beginner, intermediary, and expert to enjoy this park? Yes, sir. Is there enough amenities that individuals that are adults that may not necessarily have the same proficiency or recovery level, <laughs> should they injure themselves, do you feel those amenities are present in this design? Yes, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. And if I could, just a little more, uh, Council Member Turner. Um, in addition to myself, uh, you had a, a number of young people. Um, yeah. Mo uh, is also a skater. Um, so you did. You, you had a, a, a very wide group of different perspectives, of different ability levels, um, that all worked very closely with Mr. Thompson to kind of give them an eye, and with Spawn to, I mean, we came back and forth a couple of different times where they were very patient with, okay, well, can we change this? Can we rearrange that? Um, so yes, uh, in answer to your question, a lot of work went into that from a lot of different people in the community. Okay. So while to the untrained eye, such as myself, who doesn't have a long history of skating or anything similar, yes, sir. it looks simple. But does it cover everything you hoped it would have? Yes, sir. Okay. God, yeah, more than anything, Council Member Turner, I think we're just excited to have gotten this far. Um, skateboarding is, is uh, about to be an Olympic sport. Um, it is becoming more and more widely accepted. We have a number of our kids that are making their way down to Hillsburg on a daily basis just to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, ideally, we'd like more of them. Uh, Mr. Mayor and I have discussed about the potential in the future to see smaller parks throughout our community. We're just trying to get just that one. Um, so, so yes, ideally we'd like to see more, but no, this is a great start. Um, and it does meet a lot of the needs of the community. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else want to address the council on this item? Yes, just state your name and... Hi, my name is Keo Kubove. Um, I'd just like to say, like, as a skateboarder and someone who skates, like, all the time, uh, seeing this design is, like, like inspirational because it's been a long time and we've all been, like, looking forward to this moment. So like just seeing all the features and 
all the stuff it has, it's, it's like, uh, it's exciting. All the features and all the stuff there looks super fun to use and all that stuff would be like great for any uh, level of like skater, like old or young or anyone. There's a bunch of obstacles that people can utilize there. So yeah, thank you for your time. I ask awesome. follow -up question? Thank you. Uh, just one follow-up question before you leave. How would you compare it to you know, Healdsburg or Sebastopol, and have you been to either of those parks? Um, yes, I've been to both of them. And as a comparison, uh, I know that this one is smaller than them, mm -hmm. both of them. But um, as far as like all the stuff inside the park and all the stuff that you could use there, uh, it all looks like super usable and it looks as fun or as usable as Hillsburg. I've been to Hillsburg mostly, and um, as as I can say, I like from the design. I'd enjoy this park much more than Hillsburg. Mm. It has more stuff and it has uh, like a wider variety of obstacles to use from mm. instead of just having one sort of style that you skateboard. Yeah, that was my question. I was interested to see the feature set, and it just seems to be more than they have in Hillsburg. Hillsburg being larger, so you would agree. Yeah, okay. just wanted to yeah. hear from a skater. Yeah, no, yeah. no I, guess <laughs> yeah. I was looking at this ignorant, you know, and that's yeah. good to have the context. No, even though it's as small, there's there's much more obstacles and there's much more variety to use and to like to skate on. Oh, great, so, thank you. Of thank course, you. Thank appreciate you. it. Mo. Thank you so much for uh, having this tonight. I'm really excited to be here, to be in support of this. I'm also speaking um, for a group of people uh, from a roller derby. <laughs> um, there's about, I would say, hundreds of people waiting to, to utilize this from that sect. So we have Tricks and Bowls, we have, uh, who are an organization, and we have Resurrection Roller Girls, we have Sonoma County Roller Derby, we have Men's Roller Derby in uh, Mendocino County, we have so many different organizations that are, that are watching this with bated breath, <laughs> that they're hoping this is happening. So I just wanna say thank you so much for this opportunity to even be here tonight to do this. As well, <laughs> I just wanna give some context. My daughter who's 20, going to be, oh my gosh, 24 this year. I know, scary. <laughs> um, she was a teenager, young, young teenager when this uh, idea started. So. She is going to be probably <laughs> in her 30s, <laughs> early 30s, hopefully less than that. Hopefully we will see her 27th birthday when this happens. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we've come a long ways and, um, and we're really excited about this. Thank you. And as a business owner, I just wanna say this is an, an awesome addition to our small, coolest town mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, sector. So I just wanna say thank you for that um, because this will bring tourists, this will bring people who are interested in staying here and uh, checking us out. So thank you so much. Mo, could you just sign that sheet? Yes, I will. Thank you. Uh, I'll print your name so that they could read it. I'll try. Okay. Hi, yes, my name is Mary Neustadt, and I am very impressed that we are finally going through this. Our kids are very important. There's nothing here in Cloverdale for them to do. I am part of a huge group of parents that transport multiple boys to the Hillsburg, to the, to we go Hillsburg, Windsor, Napa, Santa Rosa, Ukiah, drop them off, they have a great day, and they're spending money there and not here, and that's not fair. I think we're talking about say the amount of money that our community could have is great. I, John has friends, he couldn't be here tonight, he has friends in Santa Rosa that will come from Santa Rosa and visit our skate park so it's very important and i want to say if we can continue to move forward we've been doing this for years we want our kids to still enjoy it before they turn 40 or 50 years old you know <laughs> what i mean and not in my backyard i think that we have to realize that kids are our future and if you don't give them so something to do they're going to do other things that are not ex you know appropriate thank, thank you, you mary mr cox Good evening, Council. I appreciate uh, the, this discussion tonight. Uh, as someone who has been involved with this skateboard park since 2008, actually it was March 21st, I looked it up this evening, uh, and have been a proponent of it ever since. Uh, so I have been involved in all of the meetings with, uh, with, with the kids. I am, not, not, I am not and never have been a skater, but I'm here kind of for for uh, some his historical value to the, uh, to the 
the group meetings. And when the gentleman, the representative from Spawn Sport Parks came up, uh, he pretty much had a blank slate. And it was the kids at the meeting that says, well, we would like to have one of these and a this and a that and all those different terms. And he managed to fill it, fit it into the, the footprint that we had. And so it was the kids that designed it uh, and the pr participants in, at the meeting. So, so when you say, does it fit the bill, it, it is the bill that they created. So I think that's the best way to put it is uh, they put in the work, they were at the meetings, um, they designed the park with the footprint, as I say, that, that they had. So uh, they did a hell of a good job and hopefully it can come, come to pass. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Anyone else from the public? Todd? Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Todd Lands. I'm here to represent the school board. Um, I want to make it very clear, school board supports a skate park. It is, this is not about a not in my neighborhood thing in any way. Mm -hmm. And we have been in support of it since 2008. I've been on the board since 2012, been part of the board since 2009, and have not been invited to a single discussion, including the ones after our uh, joint workshop that we had here. Um, on November 13th, we had a workshop here, and our number one topic was exactly this, is um, the design that had been offered to us and that we had all agreed and approved was changed without us knowing. So when the concept came back, the skate park was in a different location. Um, it was one that, without knowing what the school district had planned, put it directly in front of a brand new gym and a breezeway area for our kids to be hanging out in. So it blocks everything we do. It, it changes the direction that our kids can uh, hang out on the, on the uh, campus itself because we can't have any type of public interaction with people with this being open. And so we are concerned about that for, two, for several reasons. But one of them, is, I know you, you said it was a nuisance. Um, that's low on the list, but it is on the list. To us, it's more of our design, our concept, and you're, you're taking away the beautification of the school by putting this in front of it with fences and things around it. Um, during our workshop, we spent the good portion of an hour discussing this and how we want to work with the city to build Washington Street and have it pass through. We wanted to deed you part of our, our property to make your design work to make this work. We have not been contacted since then. Obviously, you guys have had two meetings that we didn't even know about. Um, so it, it was a little concerning and frustrating to me to see this pop up on the agenda without even having it brought to the school or say, hey, we said in November 13th we want to work with you guys and, and work through this, have a couple concepts, and not even a phone call. So I love your idea. It sounds to me like this is cart before the horse. Um, I think that your design is not a problem at all. It's not that we're against the skate park. We loved it when it was 40 feet away on the other side of the street. But because that didn't fit the new Alexander Valley design, now that the school gets it and tough beans. And so right now, I hate to say it, I mean, we, we're, we're against the location. And I would really like to work with the city instead of working against. And, it, and this right now is pushing us against. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Todd. Anyone else? OK, bring it back to the dais. We heard some some concerns uh, from Todd, and um, I'm going to ask our city manager to um, uh, get this on a subcommittee pretty pretty quickly. Okay. Mayor, if I can just make one point, uh, I want to be absolute about this comment, is uh, the school district was asked directly to have a participant on the skate park design committee, and uh, it was a direct conversation between I and the superintendent. And the response was that they were not going to appoint a representative to participate on that design committee. So I just want to make that clear, uh, um, that that was absolutely, and that was requested by council, and th th they chose not to participate. 
and and uh, and, 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 and David, I, I I really do appreciate you 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 bringing that out. Uh, I want to get beyond what happened, and right. I want to move forward with this. And the way I'd like to do that is somehow get to some subcommittee uh, so that we can sit down uh, with the school board. Uh, in the meantime, we've got three options here in front of us, and if I'm hearing you correctly, this design is for that specific location only. Um, it's not like we can pick it, pick it up and move it 40 feet and drop it back down again. So, you know, I'm not so sure if we should be spending money on it, but I'd like to see that school board uh, conversation happen sooner than later, uh, by the end of this month, if we could, to at least get it going. We, just, we, just an informal, what are you planning and what's your suggestion coming back to us to how to spin it, locate it, move it differently? And I don't want to get into it now, Todd, but you're welcome to. I just really want to, want to yeah. on that comment, um, part of that discussion we had on November 13th was our designers were supposed to get together and put together a map with everything on it uh -huh. to show how it fit or didn't fit. And I don't think that ever happened either. Yeah. And I was kind of curious on what year that was that we were asked to be Part of it because I'm not getting into that. I'm really not. I just want to move forward. Um, but as soon as you can get us those plans, you know, uh, bring them to this meeting, we'd really like to look at them and put our heads together and figure out what we can do. The staff, does that work for you? Uh, absolutely, Mayor. And it's really council direction on which subcommittee you may want to refer this to. Um, it, it, it certainly could go to a joint city school subcommittee if that's the preference. Which I believe. Yes. <clears throat> I received an email from Irene today, and if that moves forward, it will obviously need to be published and for the public, but that could very be as soon as February 24th. And I would welcome this dialogue. We have to find a way to move forward amicably. Have to. Have to. So I think February 24th would probably work for the school. Yeah, you're shaking your head, Todd. Thank you. And, and what about where we are now with these three options? Uh, I guess it's to provide uh, alternative direction to staff, page 123. Mayor, if I can, I think the direction is to refer the design back to subcommittee for, for further review. Uh, it, it's important to, to state that the uh, design work that's been undertaken by Spawn is, is, was to prepare a conceptual plan, and that's been done. So at this point, we don't have them uh, under any further contract obligations. It's, mm -hmm. it's really, uh, that's why we wanted to bring it forward, okay. is, is to, get, to get council's input, uh, because obviously further uh, discussion on the matter, if we want to redesign, would, would, would be required to come back to council uh, to you know, uh, approve additional funding and additional uh, uh, design work to you know, uh, reevaluate the site. If, if I may, yes. just to clarify, I just wonder if it's all if it if it makes sense to a, approve the the concepts and, and the feature set, um, understanding that because you know we are we want to move forward as quickly as we can. There are issues with the property. We do need to sit down with the school board and work with them so that the design of that street and the entryways all make sense for everybody. Um, is is that enough? In, is that enough for to move for staff to move this forward and go ahead and send this to the the school subcommittee with with those bullet points? Yeah, yeah I think I think uh, with that direction, staff would have a clear marching orders with how to proceed. Okay, does that make sense? And then, I mean, for for the go for for the ideas that I'm thinking of, I think you're on that joint. Todd, is that correct? You're on that that joint committee. I'd love to hear why you don't like it. It's not fair. I'd love to hear the challenges that you guys are facing, but if I could also ask earnestly, and I will be a participant in this as well, what would mitigate those concerns? Maybe not even just as simple as you need to move it. We would consider if there was. We would consider if there was. So we have an avenue in which we can actually make forward progress. Do you foresee that being able to occur before February 24th? So do you and I need to handhold this? Yes, we do. Okay. We move forward, right? You know? That, okay. Yeah, that does sound good. The other thing from the city side, uh, Councilmember Cruz needs to recuse herself 
So we'll have one council member at that table unless uh, council member Bagby or myself um, would be permitted to step in there. So uh, you, we could chew on that a little later. Okay. Anything else on this item? Okay. Well, then I'm going to close this item, and why don't we uh, go ahead and move to number okay. number eight. Um, Mr. Mayor, may uh, I uh, trouble you for a bio break, please? Sure. <laughs> We're going to take a, a five-minute break. Oh, that'll, get, that'll give us a second to, uh, to get Council Member Cruz and uh, Council Member Brigham back. Thank you.
Okay, let's come back on point here. And the next item is uh, item number... Um, item number seven, the um, uh, use of uh, and disposal of food service ware. Um, Polly, urethane. I think I said that right. Styrene. Styrene. Um, David, is this yours? This is this and is, uh, we've been through this before, haven't we? Yeah, and I'll, I'll be happy to cover that. Um, <laughs> okay. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Good, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Welcome back to the uh, Council Dais. Uh, so the item tonight before you for your consideration is uh, introduction and first reading of an ordinance that would implement a prohibition on the use and sale of disposable foodware. Uh, that uh, consists of polystyrene materials. Um, this, this item is being brought to you um, at the request of the Zero Waste Sonoma, which was the former Sonoma County Waste Management Board. The uh, presentation by Zero Waste was provided to the council back in October, and uh, at, at that time there was interest in moving forward with the ordinance subject to doing additional uh, outreach with the business community. And since that time, uh, staff did prepare a letter providing an overview of the ordinance along with some pretty detailed uh, information of materials that were developed by Zero Waste that provided businesses with uh, what the prohibitions that are identified in the ordinance along with um, some of the uh, commercial uh, options that are available, particularly to the restaurant industry. Uh, to uh, facilitate compliance with the ordinance. Uh, in response to that, uh, st staff did prepare a letter and coordinated closely with the uh, Cloverdale Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we obtained a list of all of the uh, restaurants and food retailers within the city and provided them with a, a copy of the letter inviting them uh, to provide any comments, questions, or concerns uh, to the city either by email or uh, in, in writing. Um, and there was you know, a, a nearly a 30-day time frame provided for that. Uh, in addition, there were materials that were posted uh, on the city's website uh, to, uh, with links to Zero Waste Sonoma's uh, webpage that provided uh, additional information about the model ordinance. Um, at, at, as of the writing of the agenda report, staff did not receive uh, any comments, though there was uh, uh, comments received uh, today uh, by, by one individual that was uh, in support of the, the proposed ordinance. Um, the, the, the premise of the ordinance is that it would prohibit uh, poly polystyrene uh, foodware uh, by use of, by food establishments and food providers. Uh, the basis of that is that it's, a, it's, it's not a recyclable material and contributes to our landfill. Um, in addition, the ordinance would also prohibit the sale of polystyrene, polystyrene foam products by retail vendors. So some of those products would be, for example, uh, a, like a, a, a polystyrene cooler that might, might be on the shelf. Um, and it also uh, requires that food establishments and food, <coughs> fruit, food providers to only provide single-use straws and utensils upon request and encourage uh, voluntary takeout fees for disposable foodware. Um, so what's, what's before you is, is a uh, draft ordinance that would amend our muni code to uh, it, it codify the uh, polystyrene uh, restrictions that I just discussed um, and uh, would um, it, it, you know, become effective uh, upon adoption of the ordinance. Um, one of the things I did want to bring to council's attention is the, <clears throat> the, the council does have the opportunity to include a, a timeline provision for the effectiveness of the ordinance so that it can be, be phased in over a period of time. Uh, but what staff, I think, heard from council was an interest in, in moving forward with the ordinance. Uh, there is a uh, kind of an uh, ancillary uh, aspect to this ordinance, and that is to uh, adopt an agreement so th with Zero Waste Sonoma to provide uh, community outreach and also indemnify the city 
um, you know, from any actions that are taking relative to implementation of the ordinance. Uh, though uh, it, it would be a, a city requirement to enact any, any fines or fees that otherwise might be a, uh, subject to uh, for noncompliance. Uh, the, the agency wouldn't be responsible for that uh, particular uh, role. That, that agreement is not included in your packet, and ultimately we would bring that back uh, if uh, council would like to move forward with this ordinance. So um, what we're encouraging you to tonight is uh, obviously to the introduce by title only the draft ordinance, um, and uh, if, if uh, you're so inclined, direct staff to bring it back for uh, a final reading, which we, we would we'd schedule to do so at your or next meeting. Uh, at this time, I'm happy to address any questions or comments that, that uh, uh, council may have about the, the ordinance thank, in your packet. Thank you, da thank you, David. I'm going to start with uh, Council Member Brigham, and we'll go this way, and then we'll come back and we'll tackle a couple things like when do you want it to take effect? Um, do you want the indemnification clause? Um, do you want to give the restaurant owners the opportunity to use up their inventory? How exactly do we want to do this, Marianne? No, I've, I've looked it over. I see no problem with it. Councilmember Bagby? Yeah, I'm fine with it the way it is. Okay. Councilmember Turner? Yeah, just one point of clarification for the retail, uh, specifically the retail outlets. Um, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, that it's, um, it looks very specific to the foam coolers and, <coughs> and packing popcorn, which leads me to believe this would be retailers that either sell those products in bulk or may use packing popcorn uh, to, to box and, and maybe ship their products. Does it, it, does it need to or, or specifically carve out the fact that we do have retailers that sell items that were already provided to them boxed and those manufacturers could in fact still be using polystyrene? What, what I don't want to see happen is we limit their ab ability to, to buy the wares if the state's not coming down on manufacturers to, okay, let me give this a very specific example. My wife got an Instapot for Christmas. Things fantastic. <laughs> Use it every day. Came with more polystyrene than you could shake a fist at, right? I understand that we need to take initiatives to address this issue, but I just don't know how we can compel the manufacturers to discontinue using it without state legislation and therefore would we hamstring any retailers that buy items of that nature? CVS comes to mind. Ace, um, Ace, Ace yeah. is a big one. Uh, did, uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm way off the res here, but but does does this um, address that? The, this ordinance does not address that specifically. Um, the, the the issue that uh, uh, Vice Mayor Turner you're referring to uh, falls under a term called producer responsibility, okay. and that's something that I know the um, zero waste agency is, is, is very interested in, in terms of enacting, uh, you know, tighter regulations around, uh, but, but it deals with more complicated, you know, interstate commerce issues uh, that uh, are really beyond the scope of this ordinance. Really, this ordinance is intended to be uh, directed to local businesses that uh, either sell or utilize uh, polystyrene programs, so it wouldn't necessarily address if they're buying a particular product that's packed with polystyrene, um, you know, which often is going to occur uh, if you, if you say uh, buy a TV, let's let's say for example, by a prominent e-retailer, uh, it's more than likely it's going to still come with styrofoam packing. Um, but we're, we're we're starting to see within this movement more and more of those um, those uh, uh, manufacturers are also using other products uh, from other than polystyrene. C given the the kind of um, individual interest and in the uh, consumer interest in more environmentally friendly packaging products, uh, the the ordinance would to your your comment about uh, the peanuts uh, it w would not permit a, a a mailing retailer to continue to use. Packing. Those polystyrene <laughs> peanuts, uh, and would encourage them to use, you know, other uh, more environmentally compostable type of, of peanuts, which you're starting to see a lot more uh, on, in the, on the market. Well, thank you for that clarification. <clears throat> I appreciate that. Walter. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, definitely. Okay. Is this working? Yeah.
Um, yes, uh, Jason, um, to answer your question also, uh, the board has been discussing um, res uh, retailer and um, manufacturing responsibility. Uh, this is something beyond our ability. We just want to make a statement here and um, the executive director of uh, Zero Waste Sonoma came and met with Nina uh, last year and uh, visited some businesses here in town. And she's very aware of um, that time frame that businesses need to get rid of what they have already purchased. <coughs> so um, <coughs> this is just, there's gonna be no enforcement at this moment <coughs> because people need to use what they have. They just, they are going to be given all the information to make sure that they buy the appropriate materials and equipment. The one comment I have is um, actually question, David, uh, is are we gonna be sending this information to all the service organizations, CPAC, schools, Arts Alliance, um, so that they know that they have to abide by Special event promoter means an applicant that receives. So, so is, is there a plan for that? Because I have not seen that. Uh, it, staff at this moment does not have a, a, a public outreach plan. And I think that is going to be something that we would uh, work closely with Zero Waste Sonoma to really provide the, um, you know, the, the, the public information and the marketing and outreach uh, about uh, implementation of the ordinance because they've got the uh, the staff resources to really mm -hmm. be able to uh, assist us with that effort. So uh, we would work with Nina then to provide that information to them. But then again, we have to remember that there are some businesses that are not members of the chamber. Yeah. <coughs> so well, I, I, I think staff would coordinate that with Nina um, as opposed to us, of course, as council members. Um, but do we want to give it a drop dead date when you have to start using them? Well, the, the, the state already gave a date. Yeah, and that date is what? Do you? It, it's um, well, it's supposed to be this year, but it's going to be enforced a year from now. Yeah, January. Oh, so it's January. Yeah, January uh, twenty twenty one. Okay. Mm -hmm. a, a chance to use it up. So, so I guess we'll just, of course, piggyback on that one. Mm -hmm. How about the indemnification feature? I, we'd probably want that, of course, Jose. The indemnification feature is going to be a part of the agreement. Now, what they're doing and the agreements that have been adopted by other jurisdictions is you're indemnified by passing this ordinance. There's indemnification. It's their, it's their ordinance. However, the enforcement of it, remember, in the, the ordinance itself has the actual enforcement as far as the citations go. That's the city's responsibility. So they won't indemnify you for actually issuing a, a, a citation but they'll identify you for adopting the ordinance and having the ordinance in place. And I think that the idea was they were gonna take more of the uh, issuing letters, having more of the education and having that type of a program. And if it ever got to the actual enforcement of sending a, one of the citations, administrative fines, for example, that would fall on the city themselves. But that's coming forth <coughs> in the actual agreement, uh, potentially at your next meeting. All right. Anything else, council members? Do you have enough direction to come back with that? Ordinance then? Yeah, we'd ask uh, council to you know take formal action to introduce the ordinance, uh, title only. We do encourage you, mayor and council, to uh, solicit if there's anybody in the in the in the public that would like to uh, comment on the uh, ordinance that's included in your packet. And if you uh, so agree in moving forward, we would bring it back uh, to the next meeting for formal adoption. Thank you. Uh, let me go ahead and open it up to the public. Anyone wishing to address the city council on this item, just step up to the podium here and jot your name down. Seeing no one, we'll bring it back to the city council. I'll, I'll offer there. the ordinance. If I can make a comment before that, there, there was the topic of the enforcement. Some jurisdictions, just letting you know, they've added a simple line on the... Um, on section 814030, the prohibited food service, wear, and products, that section. What and was it, 14 what? It's on page 73 of the packet. Thank you. Uh, the top section of page five of nine of the ordinance. 
and they, some other jurisdictions have added the on and after January 1st, 2021, and then it has all the, those prohibitions to make clear that those prohibitions come into place on January 1st, 2021. Other jurisdictions have just adopted it like your packet has it without that, because that's when the enforcement's happening anyway. Just wanted to bring that up in case, you know, you see that your ordinance is slightly different than maybe other folks, other neighbors. Um, I know that January 1st, 2021 was important for some jurisdictions, making sure that the actual enforcement of it. So adopting this ordinance, having the prohibition be, here's what you can't do. And this is starting on January 1st, 2021. The idea was giving almost a year of that education period. I know that that was something that was said at the presentation. Did want to bring that up. You can still make that tweak if you felt as though you, you needed to make it clear that enforcement doesn't start really till January 1st, 2021. That, that would probably be a good idea. Council members, what are your thoughts? I'm, I'm inclined because, because businesses were um, just not phased by this. Most people are already making the transition. That's why, I mean, if there was some pushback or some concern from the community, you know, and actually to set the record straight, we got two letters of support for this, not one. Yes. So just my one chance to correct city manager in my life, probably. <laughs> um, so I, and the way I look at it, too, is that one of the warnings in the staff report is that if we end up with um, different cities having different roles, um, it sort of... Um, it dilutes the training. I mean, we're all we're all going to get there on next, um, you know, on January first, twenty twenty one. But it kind of dilutes, you know, um, you know, when a vendor, especially I'm thinking Friday night live vendors, when they're going from city to city for different events, you know, it's like, oh, is it in place here? Is it not in place there? I just, I, I would advocate for going with. Uh, it goes into effect thirty days later, and then they get an automatic grace period anyway because the state. Um, pro prohibition doesn't kick in until January 1st. So I'm, I'd advocate for moving forward as it is. Anyone else have an opinion on that? I agree with her. Yeah. Uh, if, if, the, if the nature is to not deviate too far from others, if you support it, you support it, then we want consistent language yeah. right now. So. It, helps, it helps vendors, it helps businesses when, they're, when it's consistent. So. I've talked to most of the restaurateurs, too, in town, and they don't seem to have a problem with it. Almost all of them have already They've transitioned. Already. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It got brought up at the last um, Chamber of Commerce board meeting, and they had not received any negative comments back either. And um, Mo was a new board member at the time and spoke to some challenges that could be faced, but all very overcomable, in her opinion. Okay, Jose? So the, no, that is perfect. I just wanted to make sure, just in case you saw another ordinance from a neighbor or something, and wait a minute, what's that date there? Just wanted to make sure we had that, that council had that discussion, so that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have. I'm sorry. We have a motion. Shall I offer the resolution? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. It's an ordinance of the city of Cloverdale amending Title VIII of the Cloverdale Municipal Code regarding health and safety by adding Chapter 8.14 polystyrene, prohibiting use and sale of disposable food service ware and other products containing polystyrene foam. Second. Could we have a roll call, uh, Irene, please? Council Member Brigham? Aye. Council Member Cruz? Aye. Vice Mayor Turner? Aye. Council Member Bagby? Aye. And Mayor Walter? Aye. <coughs> okay, next item is item number 10. <laughs> Approval adopting a resolution approving the establishment of a pilot neighborhood um, <coughs> improvement grant program and approving the program guidelines. So that's item number 10, and it looks like it's um, uh, Kevin. Yes, Mayor, Council members, uh, this item is a resolution establishing a pilot neighborhood grant program. You may remember we had a discussion about this at our budget workshop where we kind of described what it was. Um, and as a result of that discussion, the council did include $5,000 in the current budget. Uh, these neighborhood grant programs are very common in cities throughout California. Some neighboring cities include Windsor, Santa Rosa, Calistoga. They all have these types of programs. We really did model ours after Windsor since we were kind of involved with that. And it's been up and running for eight years and it's been very successful. Uh, the purpose really is to increase communication among neighbors, uh, improve a physical condition of a neighborhood, enhance neighborhood pride, identity, and build bridges between cultural uh, groups. 
uh, some of the examples of projects that could be included, and it's kind of open to trying to you know spur some creativity on what could actually happen with the money. But uh, um, neighborhood emergency preparedness activities, and we've been talking a lot about that lately, uh, trying to help get neighbor, neighbors and blocks organized for emergencies, uh, volunteer projects, cleanups, beautification activities, organizing events uh, for neighbors to get to know each other, like block parties, uh, community gardens, and tree planting. Um, also, um, I'm going to go through a few of suggested amendments that we're going to have to present to you uh, regarding the guidelines. But um, I want to also mention that it's done on a re reimbursement basis. So they you know, perform their activities, whatever that is, and then they submit receipts to us and we cut them a check. Uh, the way it's currently written now is the council would be the awarding body of the grants. And we want to talk a little bit about that and give it maybe a different option if, for consideration. Um, and I just want to really quickly go through some of the amendments that we'd like to add to the, uh, the uh, actual the guidelines. Under el eligibility, we just want to add multifamily in there to, so that it's not just a block or a neighborhood. So there could be, there could be a group of people in, a, in a, an apartment building or a multifamily <laughs> situation, just to add a little more clarification there. We also want to, uh, we want to add a section uh, that what wouldn't be eligible. So there are things like political, religious, the uh, purchase of alcohol. It's in there, but we felt it like it really wasn't clear enough, so we want to add just another section to clarify that. Also, in the list of potential projects, we'd like to add some language about recycling as a potential project. So again, we the way it's written now is that the, the applicants would come to the city council and present their projects. Uh, each one would... Go ahead. Excuse no, me. why don't you hold your questions until no, no, he no, finishes there, his. There's one. Uh, Council member, please finish your report. Um, so the way it's written now is the, uh, the applicants would come forward to the council and, and present their ideas. Each project would be eligible for up to $1,000. Uh, in Windsor, just for an example, they did defer that to the Parks and Rec Commission. We don't have a Parks and Rec Commission, but they were the ones who ultimately gave out the, 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 the grants. In my experience in Windsor, they got more grants than they had money, so they did start to um, kind of negotiate and, and drop what each one would get by a certain percentage to try to make it fair. Um, so one of the suggestions was that we could um, punt this to the Police Finance and Admin Committee as the deciding body on who gets grants, and that's completely open to discussion. Again, the way it's written is the council. Um, I want to thank Irene, especially, for helping me with this, because I know she was involved with the Windsor one, so she did a lot of work to, to bring this to, to us tonight. So our recommendation is uh, that you help us, uh, uh, excuse me, provide direction on our word changes um, and any other changes to the guidelines that you may have, and then adopt a resolution establishing the grants program. Thank you. Council Member Cruz? Yes. Um, well, I brought... Uh, to the staff attention about these issues and there's one that was missed the one of how often can a group apply that's one that you did not mention all the other ones were covered council members anything I do have a um, I, I I think for something like this I don't understand why the city council would have to vote on this mm -hmm. issue it's um, it's too petty. It's just, it's not that it's small, it's just that if people in a neighborhood get together, I'm thinking of my neighborhood especially, um, they would be intimidated coming here and having to give some kind of a dog and pony show. And I oh, think it would have. be, what? They don't have to. No. Well, it says, um, it says in here that the city council has to approve it. Right. And so I would rather see it go to... Um, Police and finance is fine with me. That would be, a, they could say, I'd like a report, of course, you know, out on it, but mm -hmm. I think it's a lot less cumbersome if people know that they can just come and sort of privately ask for it and not have to stand up here. And mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor? Yeah. And, and I think your idea of the number of times a group can come and apply is, is really important. Yes? Yeah, I'm sorry, but what I understood from reading this is that people apply online. They don't have to come and present to the council. It says they, the council approves it. No, it present. would approve the funding, but it was not to approve the project. 
Kevin, can we get some? Well, yeah, it's, it, please, because the way that that's, it was treated. The, the way that it was written and what I was thinking following the Windsor model, again, it could be changed, was that they would come up and just describe what their projects were. Um, that's, you know, we don't have to do that. I mean, there's another way we could, we could, we could actually, you know, allow staff to give out the grants. I'd be happy with um, that. Look at, look at what you wrote on, on page 133. It says, applications are available in English and Spanish on the city's website and the city hall. And at city hall, applications must be submitted and approved prior to Saturday Friday event. But it doesn't say it has to be presented. Well, I don't think we're going to do that anyhow, uh, Council Member Chris. Next paragraph down where it's about the award process. You can't have the event if you're asking for money if we don't award it to you. And so I think what I'm hearing up here is there, there could be consensus to where even for the awarding process of the funds, we would delegate that to city staff. I, I like that. I mean. Just going back to the um, application process, what it was meant to do was um, once the guidelines were approved, then the application window would be open for a certain period, be closed after that closure, then the presentation would come back to council for council's decision, or in this case, if council directs it to subcommittee or staff, then yeah. it would be that. I, I like that much better. Subcommittee, yeah. Yeah, I don't see why well, it's more inclusive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to just throw in for city staff because then there is not the limitations of when that subcommittee or, or whatever that governing body meets. I like it. And our well, recusal snap. But that, that's just a thought. And, uh, and part uh, of that. Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. and to add to what, um, to what um, Jason said, is now that we have to recuse ourselves from so many things, I, wa I, was, I asked this question. I don't know if there was any response to it. Do we have to recuse ourselves if we're in a committee approving projects? I, I, I think the answer to the question is, and I'm, I'm going to use an attorney term here, <coughs> it depends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, and, it's a good one. and, and it's really, uh, it, it may not even necessarily be a location criteria. Uh, for example, if a group of residents that live next to you propose a, a community gathering with a barbecue, is, is that considered a conflict of interest? You have to determine is, is, is it going to have a material financial effect? Uh, and you, the council member will have to make a a decision if that is the case or not. Staff would probably argue if it's a if it's say an emergency preparedness event or some kind of community gathering, it's very unlikely that it's going to generate a financial conflict. If, however, uh, a group of neighbors get together and want to do some physical improvements, maybe to the sidewalk or plant trees. Or and, you, and, 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 they're and a council member lives adjacent to that project, uh, you, you, might, you might find that there's a, a conflict of interest because there might be some kind of property value consideration. Uh, what we didn't try to do is weigh in on all of those potential alternatives because we want to, you know, support flexibility. Um, and, uh, you know, again, conflicts of interest is, is, is something that, you know, each council member has to kind of look at independently. Uh, based on the facts that are present. And so it's hard to kind of paint that picture uh, here in, in a succinct way without knowing what the projects are that are proposed. And then ultimately it's kind of an attorney's uh, 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 venue to kind of weigh in on the conflict of interest laws. Jose? Yeah, I was just going to say I'll answer the next city manager question. <laughs> no, but, but he, he described it. That'd be great. He described it perfectly. Okay. Um, it, it just matters on what's coming before you, and that's what we would analyze. Um, so let's say we go down the route of it being city staff approval, and I hear somebody who wants to have a, a project, and I think to myself, you should apply for that grant. And then all of a sudden they come to you and they say, hey, one of your council members told you I should apply for this grant. Do, do have, have we created inadvertently a downstream effect of, of potentially influencing a decision by pure status only, if that makes sense? No. no. Oh, God, that would could put you with such you, a barrel if that was. Okay. Yeah. Kevin? If we do um, 
decide to allow staff to do this, there's a couple things we could consider here is we, we could do a, like an application period where we give them people time to do that and then we evaluate them all at the end or we could just do first come first serve until the five thousand dollars is is up um, I don't know if you have a preference on that what we did in Windsor was the the Parks and Rec Commission did grant it <coughs> oftentimes there were more requests than funding was available so then again they did drop drop the amount that each per each group got but we also did a nice presentation to the council afterwards where we, we asked the applicants who got the, the the grant to provide pictures and we you did a nice PowerPoint to see where you could see where the money actually went so very so, similar to the redevelopment agency when we used to give out um, a lot uh, yeah redevelopment money <laughs> uh, Marta? yes um, regarding the you know the timelines I'm, I'm really um, insistent that we have two periods you know like first six months second six months because in this town sometimes some news travel very fast and others don't travel as fast so in in just to make sure that people get enough time to learn about and to hear about the successful of other projects i think we should have two different periods what do you think kevin well it's not it, it is it is a certain amount of work for staff um so doing two would be, would be $2,500 each. So you could have people disappointed if a lot of applications came in and they were getting a lot less than what they envisioned. I did see that in Windsor. Uh, the other option could be is if the council likes the program and it goes over well, we can you know include it in next year's budget so that would give us two for this year, but then that would, yeah, then we would go a long time without another one. Or the council could increase the amount. Yeah, or we revisit the situation at that point in time. Well, we, we said pilot program, so we can just get the first one out, see how it goes, report back, and get the community's input. Let's not make okay. it too complicated here. Yeah, it's I know. Okay, okay, so um, yeah, let's 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 bring the <coughs> remain, remain let's bring the Coxes down here, and anybody else that might have anything to say about this. Which one do you want? Ah. <laughs> Go get them, Jeannie. <laughs> we have our own voice, Jeannie. Jeannie Cox, Cloverdale. Um, so the grant is per project rather than household. So say three neighbors are getting together to do something. They cannot each apply for $1,000. Correct. It's $1,000 only for the... Okay, that's all I needed. Just a point of clarification on the three households, that really was to encourage an, a group of people and not just one individual coming in. So that, that is one of the criteria we really need to stick to is that three people sign the application that are actually involved with the project. And they can ask for less than $1,000. Yeah. Or, or, or we can grant less than $1,000 as well. So. Just because they apply for a thousand doesn't mean that they're going to get it. So, in the sake of moving things along, because it is getting past my bedtime, um, <laughs> it's 9:04, oh and God. I know some of the council members are getting up early tomorrow morning. So, um, can we sum this up for staff? Well, at, at the advice of uh, the city attorney, we probably will bring it back on the next one with all the yeah. changes. Okay. okay. Maybe we'll put it on the consent calendar. Do you think? Did you get, catch all the changes? Councilmember Cruz wanted to. I apologize to, for missing that last one. Yeah, she wanted to make sure that um, they can uh, the number of times, and I assume you want one. Uh, and then if we could some way divide it up, I don't know um, if you think maybe that's something we have to do later. In the interest of the pilot project, I think what I mean, what I would like to see is just let's see how this one goes, and mm -hmm. then if we want to do it every six months, we could. But I think I'd like to see it. An open date and a closed date, and you're then you know we're reviewing it for this period, and it's getting approved, and that's it. And Very we, simple. We we agreed that it was staff that would be and staff okay. would be reviewing it. Yeah. Right. Cool. And, and this time we With, have to move because it's fiscal year. 
Well, it's also gardening season. Well, it's almost gardening season upon us. So let's get those. Let's get this we, yeah. moving so that so if there are any community garden or anything like that, those kinds of projects. This is seed. This is seed catalog mm -hmm. season. So we got to get moving. Yeah. It's not going to take long. So um, <laughs> with, with with that being said, uh, Kevin, you're comfortable with that, and you'll bring it back. We will. Okay. Yeah, and staff, I don't have to tell you. I mean, you'll document your decision on why. Uh, either approval or reject, so that when we get the complaints, um, we, can <laughs> we can chat with you about it, okay? Just be clear, the assistant city manager and city clerk will be the reviewing part of the <laughs> Okay, next item is the um, establishment of an uh, electrical utility underground district. And somebody's recusing themselves? Yeah, Marta and I need to. I'm Mark. So, so there's, there's uh, for this one, I know that there are different options. Um, I think that, that in, initially maybe just giving the overall presentation, and I think the council members could stay for that, okay. giving the presentation on what we're doing here, and then as soon as we start talking about options, maybe we deal with that first option that they, they're going to be recusing themselves oh, okay. on, and then, and then we'll move from there. And how about Mark? He can Sounds come back. Good. Okay. We need to know what's going on in town. Exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, staff, who has this one? Uh, uh, this looks like it's uh, Kevin. Yes. Uh, so, Mayor and Council Members, this item is a discussion of the establishment of a U underground utility district. Uh, real quick, in the 60s, the Public Utilities Commission established the Rule 20A, and that's the program that we're working from, and that basically took a little bit of uh, money from each um, electric utility bill and put it into a pot for cities to then later uh, use that for undergrounding. We currently have $850,000. Uh, in order for us to access that money, the first step is to establish a district uh, as where we're going to focus the money and you know, what, what area of town. We've laid out three potential districts. These are certainly not the only, the only ideas. Um, there's some reason behind why we pick those, and I'll just really briefly go through those. Uh, the first one is from 2nd Street to North Washington, and the reason that th this is an expensive one, this is estimated at $2.5 million dollars. Uh, the reason it's in here is because about three years ago, this was the subcommittee's recommendation. I think the idea was to get the power lines underground by City Park to help beautify that area. Uh, the second one is from Fourth Street to North Wash, or from, excuse me, from North Washington to Josephine. This one is seven, estimated at seven hundred and seventy-five thousand. These, I, I just want to point out, these are PG&E estimates. Uh, there could be more. They probably will be more ultimately. Uh, the interesting one about this one is this is listed as our SB as an SB1 pavement project, so the street could be will be torn up anyway. This might be an opportunity to work, maybe to get some savings, uh, to get sort of the paint all the paint done at once. Um, it is within our budget as well, so that's why that one is in there. Um, the third one is on Healdsburg Avenue from South Franklin Street down. That's 1.25 million. And this one was really uh, suggested because there's been a lot of undergrounding in that area already with some of the newer development in the multifamily. And it was thought that maybe we could just continue on with that because some of the groundwork has already been laid. Um, again, this one is 1.25 million. Uh, <coughs> just for, for the council's reference, uh, there is an estimated account balance of approximately $850,000 in uh, rural, the rural 20A account that's held by uh, PG, PG e So that gives you a sense of the, 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 the budget that's currently in place uh, in terms of rural 20A funds for undergrounding. And it, just one more point is that we can borrow up to five years revenue against the fund, which only totals 125000 So we could add that uh, potentially. So we're looking, uh, we're, we're presenting these options. If there's other options, we can uh, look into those again. Uh, I just want to point out that the kind of the impetus to get us really off the dime on this is the Public Utilities Commission is starting to look at this money sitting in accounts and saying cities aren't using it. Clawing back some of that money. It wasn't a big amount, but we, we did lose $4,000, I think. Um, so we just want to get the district on the ground. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a district that we can actually move forward on based on our budget, that would be great. Otherwise, we could establish a district and wait as money uh, accumulates in the account. Okay. Mayor, at this time, I, I'd recommend that uh, uh, any council members that express a conflict of interest may want to step away from the dais. 
and just record the 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 conflict occurs with the uh, third option and it's a property interest because that district is established so close to their uh, residences okay well uh, council members um, any thoughts on this I, I know I have one I've got a couple okay go go Mary um, one of the things that um, we already do have an undergrounding um, um, district that covers Cloverdale Boulevard correct that is there is one in place Staff would have to conduct additional research. Uh, there, there is on the books a uh, ordinance that provides for the city to establish an underground utility district within its city, but I'm not aware of a specific. Uh, it's, it's not in our muni code. Uh, well, the only reason I say that is because when I put that modular in the back of my property, um, we were required, even though we live in Tarman, we were required to underground everything to that modular. And it added about almost thirty thousand dollars onto that project, so it's it, it's got to exist, or they couldn't. Well, have, that's that's it, the local. Yeah, yeah I was going to say what, what I think you're, you're speaking local to, Councilmember Brigham, is the requirement in our municipal code yes. that all development underground utilities, and so it, it's it's a it's 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 a technical. Uh, municipal code requirement that utilities be underground in your frontage. Uh, That's it, clear to me now. Yeah. So um, I just want to make sure about that. Um, and I don't really know if I can speak to this, but I was thinking about the fact that um, I, I'm all for undergrounding, don't get me wrong, but what about the project that is uh, the Cherry Creek project or something like that that actually is going to need more money otherwise it's going to end up costing so much why not put this towards a project like that because it would take bring the price tag down $850,000 so there's that one there's um, South Cloverdale Boulevard we've been trying to get that undergrounded for years and one Kevin you made a point that would be about $900,000 is about, what, 100 feet. <laughs> so I, I admit it's not maybe the wisest place, but there are other options that I can see right away of ways of using that money. It really, I can attest to the fact that I'm sitting on a piece of property right now that's completely surrounded by poles. It was a ridiculous requirement for me to have to underground that. I'm the only one in the whole Tarman track that has an underground utility. So it just seems sort of, I'd rather see it go towards new building, I guess. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. I think the, the issue tonight is, that, is how to use this. Um, 800. The, the, yeah. the, 20A, yep. the, 20, the Rule 20A funds, which are for underground, and it's my understanding it's for mm -hmm. undergrounding existing poles, especially ones that are troublesome. It's interesting to know, I know we, I looked at this, when I was on the um, um, planning CBA or public works, I don't recall, and I remember looking up Rule 20A on the CPUC website, and according to their own website, it says that um, at the current rate, it'll take um, a thousand years to underground. It will. Um, it, it literally, You're literally, right. Literally, yep. literally will take 1,000 years to underground. And so this, this rate, what we're being asked to decide on is to um, look at where to establish a, um, a district for the use of these 20A funds. Um, and the, especially, the, and I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of two minds. I know, I know we need to open this up for, for public comment, but I want to get it straight from staff. I mean, what, that's what you're asking for tonight is you're asking us which are the projects that have the most, um, that we, we feel have the highest priority for the, and, we, and in order to use them, we need to establish this district. That is correct, Councilmember Bagby. We um, partly uh, the urgency with this is that uh, the CPC may continue to reallocate funds if we don't establish a district as soon as possible. They so already, they already took four thousand of ours. Yeah, and and, so. and what they what they they did because there was a technical issue with that is they they didn't actually reallocate the money, mm -hmm. so that's why they're coming back. And so we're we're uh, if one of the questions by PG&E 
to staff was, have you established a district yet? Because if you have, we'll take you off the list from future reallocation. So that's part of why we, we, we didn't do a, um, you know, a comprehensive citywide evaluation. It was, here are some key project areas that we can uh, you know, potentially accomplish some undergrounding uh, for council's consideration where we can establish a, a district and bring that forward for council's consideration. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, Second Street was something that some committee reviewed and recommended. It, it was just was never brought forward to council, uh, and I think partly because the budget for that particular effort was so significantly mm -hmm. exceeded what we had in available balance. Uh, and what came to mind was uh, these two other options: one on Healdsburg Avenue and one on Fourth. Uh, I think the idea of fourth was driven by the council's priority to uh, redo the pavement on that th with using, uh, you know, the entire section of Force, West 4th Street uh, using SB1 funds and seeking an opportunity to uh, do undergrounding work in collaboration with, or in, in conjunction with, I should say, uh, the um, the, the repaving of that entire street section to try to, you know, accomplish both because, uh, you know, it does result in quite a bit of ground disturbance uh, when either, you're doing either. You're going to repave, or, in a sense, reconstruct in, a, in, a, in an existing road section, but also do the undergrounding work. So <clears throat> often you, jurisdictions try to pair those two activities together so you get kind of the best bang for your buck in terms of efficiency, disruption to the neighborhood and so forth. But so, so, so you answered one of my questions, which was what's, what does it entail? Does it entail a, a complete repaving of the street or just the trench with the undergrounding and then we patch it? So if I hear you correctly, it's the whole paving of the street. Well, normally undergrounding would be done in and of itself. So you would cut a trench and, and put the utilities in that trench. So. Uh, you know, if you are going to reconstruct the roadway and you're going to do considerable work, you could do that trench work in conjunction with and use that re money. Re re repave. You have to be careful to, in terms of commingling funds, obviously, but some of that work is going to be can be done concurrently. If you're going to be, you know, uh, reconstructing the road, you know, it could currently come in, be able to put in the trenches and put in the conduit and facilitating that underground work. The trench is two feet wide. Well, well, let me ask you another question on, um, uh, with respect to preventing a clawback, couldn't we establish three undergrounding districts and just go forward with one for now, but we've got two kind of sitting in the hopper, waiting for money? I'll, I'll defer to the city attorney on that, uh, if, if we could, you know, look at the opportunity to do three districts and then council just prioritizes by way of funding which one they do first. Yeah, which one gets done first. <clears throat> Yeah, we can take we can take a look at that a, a little further. I know that the that the first kind of what we were trying to do as staff was looking at kind of what's the, kind of a real project. That way, there was PG&E was saying, okay, that, that's a real project. They didn't just do the the city mm -hmm. as the big district, and you know we'll we'll take on projects when they when they uh, when they come up. I thought that there was some type of this is kind of a real project. This is something we're investing, but let us. We could take a look at timing requirements, right? Mm -hmm. As far as when you set up the district, maybe how much time do you have? And I think that's what you're asking, Mayor, time-wise. That way, we're, we, we expand it as much as we can. Well, so, you know, just my opinion, uh, I'm in favor of uh, um, number two, the fourth street. Uh, again, it, it falls back on the fact of the condition of the road um, and the fact that we can afford it. So, council members? Yeah. Did can you? we add? The boulevard, the whole boulevard, as another district. We will. We'll have to look into that. Um, if we're gonna, I mean, if we're gonna have like three, why not have four? I mean, t to my mind, we would continue undergrounding what's already undergrounded on the boulevard, as opposed to, you know, I, I think it's a good idea for the Cherry Creek, but if if it's up and down and just in front of theirs, it would probably make more sense to just continue what's already undergrounded and working south. But I agree. Yeah. And, but I'm just saying, just in case somebody needs an incentive to underground in front of property on the south. Yeah. Just 
Okay, I'd like to open it up to the public. Anyone wanting to address the council on this item? Okay, let's close it, bring it back to the council, and let's give some direction. Yes. How's this? There you yeah. go. There we go. Thank you. Uh, the, the option one, Second Street, it's not a beautification project. It's a safety project. Um, those, the, the the sidewalk on the north side that leads to um, Second Street Park has power poles right in the middle of the sidewalk. Mm. You can't have a. You know, oops! There goes my now. There goes my name tag, Dennis. You're, <laughs> there we go. Um, how are they going to know who I am? Um, it's it's it uh, to me that has um, and that project did come before um, the subcommittee and it, it's been at least two or three years and I I have to say that I have to put emphasis on that project um, what was done to those sidewalks is just absolutely inexcusable and if we have an I know that I know it's the biggest ticket item but it has the most impact to kids people in strollers people in wheelchairs I I just think we and that's what this. Um, um, Rule 20A money is for is to fix you know egregious uh, problems like that. So um, obviously we don't we're not going to have the money for it. But then I guess I'm of two minds because um, option two where Fourth Street is that is a mess. But I'm also reading that it looks like we're not sure we could maybe get that um, established before we have to do the road work anyway. Could you just kind of walk us through option two? Am I reading that correctly? Uh, absolutely. And um, what, I'm going to foreshadow what uh, is going to come before the Public Works Subcommittee uh, next week, and that is uh, discussion on SB1 funding. So it's mm -hmm. going to give you a perspective on uh, funding for the you know, road improvements on, on 4th Street. Um, <clears throat> the, the project that is included in the packet uh, regarding undergrounding is to do the section from North Washington to Josephine, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 775 feet of undergrounding. Uh, if council said that that's an important project, one of the requirements of bringing these projects forward is we, we do have to specifically prepare a, a map exhibit, and I believe we have to conduct a public hearing for the, that enables the residents to, to, to weigh in. So, you know, we have to be, mm -hmm. that's where we may want to be cautious about how many of these districts we <laughs> we want to establish uh, because we'll we'll be doing a lot of mapping work and a lot of engagement community for projects that may not come to fruition for you know quite a, quite a while um, uh, but if council did say that they'd like to see us move forward with that project we would um, look at how the designs for the undergrounding could be coordinated with the reconstruction effort for uh, improvements to Fourth Street, in, in, in essence, and bring you know, I, I <clears throat> we'll we'll have to uh, do more work to evaluate you know whether that can be all done in one in one bid package mm -hmm. or not. Uh, my sense is it could, and we just make sure that we uh, segregate the funds for the purpose for which they're intended. Uh, but that would enable then th those two those two uh, separate but related projects to occur concurrently. Um, if you know, we'd still go through our normal process of uh, preparing and designs, uh, bid specs, issue them to get you know bids with real numbers that we would then bring back to council uh, to to award. Where, where would the money come for the paving? I mean, SB1. the underground. Huh? SB one, possibly. So the the the, the uh, paving work uh, would come from uh, SB SB one. Uh, for reconstruction of uh, Fourth Street, which yep. is which has been the council's uh, primary uh, project uh, on on the SB one funding list. And how much do we have in that fund now? It looks Just like the project, um, based on current preliminary engineering estimates, is uh, that work will cost about three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. And that would 
uh, entail using s s uh, some of the future allocation of SB1 revenue? I don't have an exact well, count or dollar amount in front of me. Well, uh, when, when we went to do Rockydale, I mean, that was astronomical. And, and this is so much bigger. Any reason why the difference? I mean, 300000 doesn't seem like a lot of money to repay 4th Street, I guess is what I'm getting at. But we'll figure that out, I guess. It, we'd have to look at the engineering estimates and, and see how close we are based on market conditions uh, to, to, to validate that cost. Uh, I'm just looking at, you know, real time, uh, the, mm -hmm. the agenda report that's in the Public Works Subcommittee uh, that was uh, posted up uh, up today, um, and I, I don't have the I don't have the the, the uh, backup to support that, that 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 cost estimate. Okay, but it's probably based on a certain square foot of pavement rehabilitation uh, at a certain per square foot cost, and and how that was generated uh, based on recent cost estimates for uh, that type of asphalt uh, pavement work. What's your pleasure? Um, well, logically, the 4th Street, but I don't believe it could be paved for $300,000 either, but um, that's beside the point. I really um, would like to, if we're going to do three districts without the mapping and everything, if we're going to do that, I would like to add Cloverdale Boulevard all the way down <coughs> um, just so we have it. But um, I don't see why we can't wait to see what we think about which option. Um, I would have to agree with Melanie in that I think that the second street one is probably the most damaged as far as the sidewalks and everything, but there's no way we're ever going to get you know, 2 million, 500,000. That's undergrounding 2,500 feet. So for me, I guess it would be logically the second choice because it's the only one we could do and actually do it. Maybe. Melanie? Well, we're looking at the, the total minus the 850 grand credit we have right now, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's, is that correct, Kevin? So were the two, at the 2.5 million or the, we, it would be the difference between that and 850 grand, if Correct. we were to use yeah. okay, so it's not 2.5. It's we'd have to make up the difference. You could add 125 to what we also have for the okay. Five to, years. To, if we borrowed for the next five years, that still wouldn't be enough. I mean, still, well, no. we'd still have to make up the the 1. difference, 5. and then we but we could totally pay for option two. I exactly. mean, yeah, 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 I get it. Um, so where would we get the balance um, if we if we chose option one? That would require us to develop a, a, a financing plan for mm -hmm. council's consideration to look at what, what funding sources are available to be able to close that gap. You'd be looking at a combination of, of funds. Uh, you know, is, is, or look at in, uh, impact fee balances, uh, grant revenues, uh, uh, general fund, you know, and, and what each amount would be able to contribute to be able to close that gap. It's a big gap to close, yeah. uh, but that would be something we'd want to uh, you know, refer to subcommittee. You know, one, one other option that comes to mind, and it requires us to do uh, additional homework, is you can see, for example, um, with option one, that, that is, uh, it, it, the length of undergrounding is, is 2,500 feet. There's nothing that constrains the council from reducing the length of undergrounding. Now, that doesn't accomplish a complete road section, but for example, if council said, we just want to really look at the frontage along, let's just say five houses, for example, um, at you know a typical uh, width of, of, let's say, 100 feet, uh, which is pretty wide, pretty wide yard, and they're not that wide, uh, you know, it's 500 feet, you know, and, and and address the critical, uh, you know, health and safety issues with with where these poles are located. What that 
requires, however, is a, is a more refined look at the, the area that you want to underground. Um, and I mean, there's nothing that says we have to do uh, the entire length of the section. Um, it's just, it, it just makes more sense if to, to, get, to get those entire sections so you don't have poles uh, at, at, at either end of the, the sections that you're, you're undergrounding. You're trying to kind of go from an, under, an area where you, it's already underground and, and connect that entire section, if that makes, if that makes sense. Yeah. So and I just want to start at the park and go towards the boulevard. You'd yeah. rather go from yeah. the boulevard and start. Yeah. yeah. I get you. And there's, I mean, there's other, there's other costs with, um, you know, the, the one-time design costs, the, the, the whole effort of putting out bid documents and bid specs. So, you know, obviously the larger area you can accomplish, there's efficiencies there. Um, so I, I guess I, 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 I throw that out there because if council would like to uh, take a more refined look at this issue, I think th there are, there are uh, opportunities for, to do that. Um, you know, again, what we're presenting are kind of more of, you know, larger scale uh, projects that, you know, accomplish kind of complete sections of, of roadways. Uh, and, and, but it doesn't have to be that way. So it was just, that was kind of the, the, the concept that is embodied in what, we've, what we're presenting to, to council. Well, I think as much as I appreciate what council member Bagby is saying, <clears throat> I'd still rather see us jump in and finish a, a, finish a, a, project. a, a whole project <laughs> instead of doing a quarter or a half of a street or a block. Gus, can I ask one more question? Sure. Um, now, this is before, so you're saying 775000 for this one, plus you can throw another um, 125 in if we borrow some more, which brings us up to about um, $900,000 rounded. So... About well, 975 Right. So um, if we do that, then how much is it going to cost, really, to get the bids out, to do all the rest of it, Realistically, how much will we have to actually spend? I mean, it's nice to see that 775 and go, oh yeah, we can make it. But in reality, once everybody takes their bite out, is there going to be enough left? Well, certainly, staff. You know, through the design process, that's that's how you refine it. Um, and you know, we haven't. Oh, just a guess. Yeah. Guess. <laughs> I mean, typically, uh, design and engineering costs um, can be somewhere. You know, 10 to 15 percent of the costs, but they can they can go up from they can go up from there and be even they can be 25 percent. Uh, you know, I, I don't know with this type of project uh, if that um, a, the holds true. Uh, you know, it, it's it's not a lot to design, uh, but you still have to do it, and you have to account for uh, other utilities that you're working around, oh, yeah. including you know wastewater Cable. and sewer facilities mm -hmm. that may be in that right of way. Uh, you know, put drawing up the easements that uh, need to be put in place um, for, to ensure that there's, you know, the, the right type of uh, utility easement. Probably wouldn't be more than 30% of the whole project. Yeah, unfortunately our, our city engineer can't speak to this yeah. and he would be uh, uh, <laughs> That's a person but yeah. I mean, if staff wants uh, uh, or council wants staff to divide to uh, delve into this further and do more evaluation, uh, we, we certainly can. Uh, you know, and it might be best to kind of refer this back to, to subcommittee. Um, you can see really by the numbers that are presented, it, it's it's based on you know a uh, what looks like a thousand dollars just a linear foot. Um, and I don't know if that embodies all of the costs, or is that just construction? That's what I'm curious yeah. about. So, okay. I have one more question. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so again, just on on option one, it's if we used theoretically, if we used everything we had, there's a shortfall of seven hundred twenty-five thousand. So. Are there, and I'm wondering if we just, if we need some more information from, um, from Eric and um, engineering staff, because I'm just wondering if there are other, is, this is, we're looking at using, you know, establishing the district and using the, you know, the Rule 28 funds, but especially since this is near the park, um, are there, are, is, there an, is there an opportunity 
what other opportunities are there for grant funding, safe routes to school, you know, other sources that could block help grants. with yeah. block grants, you know, CDBG, is that right? Um, that just, or what, what other possibilities are there? Um, you know, because, because that specifically is the main street to City Park. And, and, and Mayor and Council, maybe I can offer up one suggestion so we can uh, be able to provide the necessary technical resources to work on this without a conflict of interest, is if Council would agree to eliminate option three, um, then the, the conflict of interest issue, I think, might go away for our city staff. <laughs> okay, uh, great. Let's do that. Let's do it. <laughs> well, wait uh, I, 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 Look to our city attorney. We're almost if, done with this. Uh, if, we if want to sell over. <laughs> and that's something that uh, council that's can true. kind of say. You know, really the focus is between option one and option two. We want more details, uh, or really option one. Uh, you know, go back staff, do your homework, put together uh, all the uh, different financing options, and you know, go 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 work towards you know getting the money. Um, then them that them eliminates that the conflict of interest. Uh, for site two. So yeah, I, I think that, so what, and we'll to get con concurrence. I mean, that's what I would like to see is just more information on one and two, because it sounds like there's most the most interest in those yeah. two options, um, because I think that they have unique financing opportunities to, to each of them. And also, it may be moot, because we may be not be able to make the deadline to incorporate this into the project on, on option two. So maybe we need to come back with some more information and some more options. So if I may, so I, apologize, I, I appreciate that comment. Um, the, I know that David's comment about option three is really we, we haven't heard much about option three. I think that the main focus has been option one and two or bringing back more information about how we could, how could we expand this even further. Um, and that's, I think that that's what the comment was about. We don't hear a lot of interest in option three. If option three is really off the table, it would probably be just an efficiency-wise, um, truly taking it off the table, and then we could bring in our folks that are uh, that are recused if that's if that's the case. We can move, or we could just move forward. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I you would know? like to see us move forward with um, and bring it back with the fourth street, but come back with more information. Fourth street. Yeah. Okay. Is that enough direction? Yes, it, it, it's really focused on 4th Street at this point, coming back with more information as well. But also possibilities for 2nd Street, and like just because I think that there are more opportunities for funding there, if I'm not mistaken, and so maybe it doesn't look as bad. Maybe, it doesn't, maybe there isn't a $750,000 deficit. Maybe we could get that down a little bit. Um, that's, and, and I just want to, and I'd like to have a balance of that when we're looking at the two projects. Marianne, you okay with that? Yeah. Okay. Let me open it up to the public. Any comments from the public on this item? Okay, seeing no one, we'll go ahead and uh, staff has their direction. We'll call uh, Council Member Turner, Council Member Cruz, and um, City Engineer Mark Rincon back to the dais. Folks, you can come back. And we're going to move to item number 12 which is a professional services agreement with Hagner Brand Consulting LLC to update our water and sewer rate studies. And this is um, Mr. Kelly. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mayor and uh, members of the council. So the item before you tonight is a um, professional services agreement and scope of work with uh, Hildebrand Consulting uh, LLC or Limited Liability Corporation for preparation of an update to the water and sewer rate study. Uh, the current study under which we are operating uh, does not provide for uh, or do an analysis of uh, water rates beyond the current fiscal year. So therefore, uh, in future years, uh, the, the city would be in a position to not be able to adjust uh, sewer and water rates. Um, what's before you is a proposal to uh, conduct an updated water rate study to evaluate uh, what rates would expect it to be uh, over the next three to five year time frame. Um, Mr. Hildebrand, who's provided a, uh, a scope of work, is a, um, was, was a partner of the firm, former firm that prepared our current, uh, the current study uh, and 
unfortunately, he is, he is, uh, he is retiring, uh, though he would uh, be able to assist with uh, Mark on this effort um, if council supports moving forward. Um, one of the nuances with the proposed scope of work is to also look at a, um, our proposed capital improvement pro projects for both the water and sewer enterprise and look at how those would be financed via uh, updated rates. Um, the council, I did want to point out, does have the option not to proceed with uh, updating sewer and water rates. The, the potential uh, downside to that is that uh, down the road, uh, when you do look at rates, if they aren't adjusted, you may, it may be necessary to increase them much more significant than they might otherwise be done on an annual basis. Uh, as uh, we know, uh, we operate in an environment where there's inflation and costs, uh, even uh, outside our control, tend to go up. Um, and so therefore, those utilities <laughs> will be subject to increased costs but without the ability to recoup them through increases in the rate study. Um, so what staff's proposing is that we engage the services of uh, uh, Hildebrand LLC to start the work of conducting a uh, sewer and rate study. Uh, the uh, staff report does uh, provide an overview of the tasks that would be uh, identified uh, during the, um, as part of the, the scope of work. Uh, and would address you know, some of the same things that were done as part of, of the study that was uh, adopted by the council in 2016, including conducting the uh, water sh shortage sur surcharge analysis that was previously performed. Um, <clears throat> but in addition to that, again, including the uh, capital improvement costs that will uh, be provided to council in a draft CIP uh, I think in the near future for your consideration. So part of that will, the council will be asked to uh, weigh in on the proposed capital improvement projects that you'd like to see uh, funded in the next three to five year time frame. We would then work with uh, uh, the rate consultant to implement those projects uh, uh, into the rate study so that we start to build the fund balance to be able to uh, undertake those important improvements. There, there are a number of uh, ancillary activities that are going on uh, that uh, also weigh in and affect the study, and that includes looking at the assessment district that we are evaluating in the infrastructure improvements uh, at the southwest corner of uh, the city. Uh, so all those things are going to be, you know, we're, we're, we're working uh, we'll, we'll have to take that work effort along with the CIP and implement this in part of the study. The goal would be to bring forward a rate study uh, prior to the end of the fiscal year so you could have in place uh, proposed rates for the next fiscal year. Uh, but again, I want to be clear that council does have the option to not proceed. Uh, we can uh, obviously um, uh, not engage a rate consultant. Uh, and let rates, you know, basically they would stay where they are today until such time that we did engage a consultant in the future um, or uh, engage in a more uh, uh, competitive process where we seek additional proposals from uh, consultants. <coughs> you know, you, you look at different methodologies uh, for uh, preparation of rate studies. Uh, but the, uh, Mr. Hildebrand was chosen based on his close uh, relationship with Mr. Bob Reed, and, and Bob's been someone that's been before the council on numerous times uh, and um, has prepared studies that, uh, uh, it, uh, you know, address our particular needs. So that's why that, that, that the proposal was presented. Um, and um, we didn't bring this to subcommittee because there was a kind of a time constraint to get this before council, you know, as soon as possible uh, so that uh, there was no further delay. Thank you, David. Uh, why don't we start over here on my right, uh, Vice Mayor Turner. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just a question about uh, the, the capability of the, of the study. Um, is it your experience, and, and maybe Mark, you can comment on this, maybe, I don't know. But anyhow, is it your experience that the, the study would also consider uh, pending legislation that may affect your ability to recoup costs um, through uh, 
you know, for example, the ADUs and the JADUs um, not charging, not being able to charge impact fees for those developments in order to really promote the concept of, of more housing for individuals. And I, and I understand that more, more people on the, say, main line will in, in, incur more cost in itself just by increased water usage. However, will there be consideration for the fact that it, it could very well have a, a higher impact on the system as a whole? and other legislation that may be coming down affecting our ability to recoup costs. I would hate to put that burden on, on, the, on the, the rate payers, but I'd love to see what their idea of the study is and, and if that's a capability. Yeah, normally as part of this process, the consultant works closely with the, the city engineer and, and the city planner on the development assumptions that uh, uh, the, 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 the city believes it's going to uh, experience going forward so that it can build that into the cost basis for the rates. Um, where the issue of ADU specifically, uh, in my mind, has an impact on the city is in terms of our capacity. And um, typically where cities recoup costs for capacity issues is through development impact fees. And unfortunately, uh, from my perspective, um, but there are, are some benefits to it, is that uh, certain ADUs uh, w under certain criteria are uh, under the, the, the new housing legislation are not uh, subject to impact fees. So in essence, they're not paying for their kind of fair share of their uh, capacity consumption. And what that does is then puts a more of a burden on future rate payers when you build in those capital improvement projects that you're not showing an offset from impact fees. So that, that's kind of uh, 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 something I think that uh, um, uh, the rate study would certainly have to evaluate is, you know, what, what impact are those, those types of ADUs having on capacity and back into how that is going to affect rates. My initial assessment is it's going to affect rates uh, based on the uh, breakdown of future uh, capital improvements between uh, existing development and new development. And, and so I think ultimately it's the rate payer who picks up that additional cost and, uh, and that gets embedded in, into the study. And while the study may come out with a threshold on which we could raise the rates based on their findings, we don't necessarily have to do all that at once, I presume meaning we could get a study that comes back and says you could potentially raise 3% and we decide to stagger that 1% over three years or anything like that. We have some uh, decision-making ability as a council on that. My understanding is, is what a right consultant does is set the maximum uh, rate that the council can charge under Prop 218, but it doesn't obligate the council to, to, to charge that full, that full rate. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, uh, Council Member Cruz. So you're indicating that the uh, gradual increase. That that it, that is ultimately a policy decision for council. For, for example, uh, you say you perform a rate analysis and and the, the recommendation uh, for full cost recovery and establishing a higher level of reserves for capital projects, let's say is, let's say is 7%. Uh, <clears throat> but council says, we think we, we don't want to raise rates 7%. Uh, you can raise them 5%. But what you couldn't do is necessarily raise them 8% when, the, when the, the, the study says that the maximum is 7%. So, so Mayor, if I may, yes. just to add a little to that, and, and I know Mark is very familiar with this as well, when you're when you're setting your, your, your fee, your, your rates, uh, it's correct. The Proposition 218, the process, it's your, they're paying whatever the cost is. But in order to calculate what the cost is, there's the projects. And what are, you, what are your list of projects that you need in order to deliver water? Now, I've seen jurisdictions say, well, we want to hold off on those projects. Sure, we need them, but we're going to hold off on that or we're going to hold off on some maintenance. Um, and that's kind of how, how you kind of bring rates down. The only caution there is the more you, you 
don't do, the more you will have to do later, and then it kind of just adds up. But, but as far as the staggering, you also will build models as far as, okay, not all at once, but potentially having in your, in your cycle of potential increases, that 2%, 3%, whatever it is, um, there will be some options for the council most likely on how to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank go, on, go ahead, Mark. Uh, may I ask uh, about um, uh, the, the prices of consultants? It, is that the standard um, price per hour? Let's see here. Hourly rate. It's 210 and 3 something. Yes. Uh, Bob, Bob Reed is his uh, historically, that's his, the rate that he has charged the city. He's a uh, very senior, experienced uh, uh, rate study consultant, um, and and I, I I don't I don't see the, the numbers as being uh, unusual for this this type of work, um, but the the manner in which you, you, you do a fair comparison um, is you get multiple proposals from multiple firms and you kind of do that evaluation, uh, but you also have to balance that with the qualifications of the consultant as well. Um, and so it's, you don't want to seek proposals just simply based on price. It, it, you want to look at their qualifications and price uh, and, and, choose, and choose accordingly. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just wondering um, on selection process, yeah. that's all. Yeah. You said different proposals? That, 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 that would be an option for council would be uh, direct staff to issue a, uh, an RFP um, and you know seek competitive pro proposals uh, and then evaluate the scopes of work kind of absent the, the dollar amount and, and see if it, it, you know a different methodology is really what the council is seeking uh, or a, you know a preferred methodology uh, and and then uh, ch you know choose that and look at the, the costs that, for that that the, the the proposed scope of work and, and choose accordingly. How long ago did we have a rate study? Uh, the last rate study was done was in 2016. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Bagby. Uh, so, I apologize if this is not, if this isn't germane, but um, will the agreements that we have in place with Bear Republic on water and sewer have any um, uh, bearing on this or is it going to be included in, in part of the study? I, I think the, some of the agreements with Bear Republic would be factored into the study because the, um, particularly regarding the um, bonds that were financed, the improvements, mm -hmm. and that's currently debt service, mm -hmm. so that would ultimately have to be uh, analyzed as part of the rate, set, rate setting uh, going forward is what our, what our bond payments are. Um, you know, in uh, it, 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 that may be a good question. Is is you know based on the most recent data reports that are being submitted for their water use, but maybe more importantly, their their uh, wastewater reports. You know, does that that factor into the uh, the treatment needs or cost of service in some way that then has an impact on rates? Uh, but I don't know. If the yeah, I know the engineer sees city engineer sees those reports if. He wants to uh, elaborate on that. Yeah, there are industrial wastewater permits. Right. We're finalizing a, a perpetual one. Uh, right now, their, their cycle built system is, is a quarter and a half inches, so mm -hmm. they're not adding additional surcharge to it. Right. Okay. I just want to make sure that if there's anything that is going to affect them uniquely, that they're involved <laughs> at an early stage. <laughs> Councilmember Brigham. I'm good. You know, um, I've done this a couple of times, rate increases. I really hate doing it. It's not a rate increase. But, uh, well, it's a study. <laughs> but one of the things, um, I'll tell you what, uh, it's, it's, it's far worse to have to play catch up. You know, uh, there's one thing people hate is when you don't increase rates or, or proportionately uh, charge them, and then all of a sudden, bang, you hit them with a pretty significant increase, so I'd like to see us move forward with it. Um, just one clarifying question, uh, the, the uh, cost is not going to exceed 59000 
that's captured into their suggested rate increase, correct? That is my, my understanding. Okay. All right. But we, we have confirmed that with, a, with an agreement. Uh, I mean, their proposal is what it is, and so yeah. we would want to have them stick to it. So we have a couple options here, and one of them is to um, reject uh, the resolution, uh, direct staff to obtain the proposal, and uh, provide uh, alternative direction to staff. Um, and with that proposal, they would uh, also, I guess, be looking for um, uh, future um, um, projects that we may be doing, correct? A more in-depth study than, than just the basic services. Correct. We'll, yeah. we'll be presenting to council uh, a, a draft capital improvement program, uh, okay. hopefully fairly soon, and there will be a conversation around the capital improvement projects that get, get brought into the rate study. Let me open. Yeah, sure. Let me just open it up to the public first. Anybody wanting to address the council on this um, uh, study? Seeing no one, we'll close the public comment. Bring it back to the dais. Um, Vice Mayor Turner. Yes, thank you. Hey, Mark. Uh, this reminds me a little bit of the um, the engineering study that is done every year, and and sometimes we get some some pushback on why haven't we selected a new company, and and ultimately you did open up RFP, and and honestly no one else bid in. What what do you foresee for the competitive nature of of companies wanting to come do this? Is it Anyway, what, what's your opinion on that? Well, the thing is, is that, you know, if we would go out to an RFP, we'd probably delay the project by six months. And, and like, like David had mentioned, we're coming up against when this current rate study will expire. And so we have no basis to, to increase the rate. So we'll be, again, it may be just a year, but we'll be doing catch up. So at this point, I'd say let's go with the, uh, the firm that had done the previous one. And it, it could be a three-year, you know, rate study, and then in three years we go out with an RFP for other, other consultants. Because I've worked with other consultants, and I see that the value they can bring as well. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. That's all for me, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else, Council? There's a resolution. Oh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to recommend the resolution by title only. Resolution of the City Council of the City of Cloverdale authorizing City Manager to execute a professional services agreement with Hildebrand Consulting LLC for preparation of a water and sewer rate study. I will second. Seconded by uh, Vice Mayor Turner. Could we have a roll call, please? Council Member Cruz? Aye. Vice Mayor Turner? Aye. Council Member Bagby? Aye. Council Member Brigham? Aye. And Mayor Walter? Aye. Okay, folks, just one more item to go through. Uh, item number 13, professional services agreement. And I, I guess this has to do with the um, Kincaid uh, fires. And this is, let me see. Huh? Jose. I'll go ahead and Jose? I'll handle this, Mayor. Um, so the, the item before you, I won't go into too much detail. Um, uh, the, it's in the staff report, but obviously, the, as the council knows and the public knows, we has, I mean, it was in October the Kincaid fire happened. Um, although, thank goodness there wasn't, there were no, there was no fire damage to our city. There were a lot of expenses. There were a lot of, of expenses that the city had to <coughs> undertake. Um, there was obviously also the power, the uh, power shutoff, the public safety power shutoff that happened. Um, so when when something like that happened, I think uh, and. We brought the last council meeting, staff brought forward kind of the report, kind of the download of kind of what happened um, and, and what, was the Im what were the impacts to the, to the city. When something like this happened, we're left at the end kind of scrambling, saying, okay, well, what do we get to recover? And there is, of course, you're looking at FEMA, you're looking at the different federal programs or whatnot to say, okay, let me recover some costs. But that never really captures the true costs of what happened to, to the city. Um, the, the city became, again, we didn't have to evacuate. You know, there was, no, there was no fire here as far as that happened here, but there were a lot of impacts of folks that were evacuated that ended up here. There were, there were a lot of costs of just managing uh, uh, that the city had to go through. There potentially may have been costs to the, the uh, city's uh, sales tax maybe. There were other impacts that we don't even think about. Well, last month, the... A law firm, the law firm of Aaron and Bud, reached out to all of the city attorneys in the region 
Now, this law firm was one that represented the county and the city of Santa Rosa in 2017 fires and helped them through that recovery or that, that um, the judgment against PG&E. They contacted all the attorneys and said, look, there's this fire happened. You know, we've looked at it. And of course, it's, it's kind of everybody's kind of looked at it by now saying who's responsible and saying, look, we can represent join together as, as, as many as who, who as many of the jurisdictions that want to join together and maybe there, there's, a, there's an opportunity for a potential action against PG&E. Um, council did, I did discuss this with council, um, and the, the agreement before you is from uh, entering into an agreement with Barron and Bud to represent the city as long, a, along with other jurisdictions in the county. I know the county has approved the, an agreement similar to this already with this law firm, representing them against PG&E, um, seeing what other uh, collection of, of damages is out there, not just what we're going to get from, from our regular recovery of having, okay, how much staff did we, did we use or what was the cost of that, but getting to the real, more of the real costs for the city. Um, the, the agreement is a contingency-based agreement, so it's not a per hour, so it's not a, oh, I have to keep paying it every month. It's an 18% contingency, meaning you only pay if there is any, kind, any, any reward. Any, any verdict, um, any recovery. And it would be only 18% of that recovery. That's, that's the experts come above that. Um, but again, the county has approved something like this already, so there is also cost sharing. Um, the more folks join in. Uh, I know in talking with the attorney from Barron, but he did expect some other folks to join into the, the litigation, if not now, later. Um, there was some, um, some not, not urgency, but some recommendation of it's better to join early. That way there's more of a, a, a force, right? There's more of a lot of folks coming to PG&E's door saying, okay, this is a claim we have. Um, let's talk. And let's talk fast. So again, counsel, before you, it's a contingency agreement with Barron and Bud, the law firm that represented the county and the city of Santa Rosa in 2017. It was a big, big verdict. Um, they're a very experienced law firm. I think they have, they have settled... Um, they have come with verdicts of over a billion dollars, I believe, in the last few years on, on, these, on, on fire, on these types of events. So um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that the council may have. Thank you, uh, Jose. Marianne, anything? Nope. Councilmember Bagby? Not right now. No. Okay. Councilmember Turner? Uh, no, no specific questions, no. Thank you. Councilmember Cruz? Okay, let me open it up to the public. Anyone wishing to address the city council on this item may do so. Just step up to the podium. Seeing no one, we'll close the public comment and bring it back to the dais. Anything, council members? Well, there's a resolution uh, from Barron and Bud to enter into an agreement. Would anyone like to make that resolution? Like council member Cruz? Okay. So I recommend that we adopt a resolution title, Resolution of the City Council of the City of Cloverdale approving a professional services agreement with Baron Budd and Dixon Diop and Chambers at LP for specialized services concerning litigation arising from the King Cake fire and public safety power shutoffs. Is there a second? Second. Could we have a roll call, please, Irene? Council Member Cruz? Aye. Vice Mayor Turner? Aye. Council Member Bagby? Aye. Council Member Brigham? Aye. And Mayor Walter? Aye. Thank you. Okay, subcommittee items. Anything? M Mayor, I, if I can, I believe there was an item pulled from the consent agenda. Oh. Item number five, did we not approve that? I recall we did. No? It was a separate vote. Oh, separate vote. Yeah, okay. we did a separate vote. Is, was that what you were concerned about? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, subcommittee items? Anything? Okay, subcommittee reports. I don't really think there's any at this point, so we're going to skip over that. Um, council re reports, verbal, anything? I have a quick verbal one. Yep. I uh, met with our police chief, Jason Ferguson, last Monday. Fantastic meeting. I look forward to more. And I met with Eric Sanders, our new um, planning commissioner, and I, I plan to meet with the others as well. But I did want to offer um, my appreciation for recommending him. I think he's going to be fantastic at that role. Thank you. 
Anyone else? I just um, had one addition I neglected to include. Um, I submitted uh, my report in writing, and I neglected to include the uh, legislative meeting from last Friday in Santa Rosa with uh, mayors and council members. And one of the items that did uh, arise is that we will be discussing the um, the ballot measures um, at the next meeting. So it'll be, I will look forward to a summary and getting direction from um, the council where we're going to stand on those measures and um, which ones we might favor, not be in favor of, or be neutral on. So that's your homework. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, legislative reports, anything? City manager, city attorney reports. Mayor, council, uh, just, just one item uh, that I wanted to just real quick brief you on. We've been approached by a representative with M Mendocino Inland Water Power Company about a common interest agreement. Uh, the, they've done quite a bit of work to try and uh, reduce the process by which she could become a, uh, a member uh, under the common interest agreement so that they can share information with us. And that's something that um, we'll be working on with the city attorney uh, to, uh, he's done preliminary review, and, but we've had discussions uh, with, with uh, their staff and uh, the plan will be to bring that forward for, for council's consideration. So that, um, and, and I'm pretty sure we'll, staff will be recommending that we proceed because uh, we the, the, we don't really see a downside with be, being a, a partner uh, in terms of the common interest agreement. So that uh, council can be apprised of important information on the status of the project that otherwise they can't disclose to the public. Sure. Did Janet indicate any necessary timing? Will it get done if we, if we see it at the next council meeting? Is that enough time for them? I, I responded to, to, to Ms. Pauly today about the next meeting, and, and I haven't heard back from her yet. Okay. Yeah. I just was wondering if there was a timing issue on that. Yeah. So we might need to follow that, and if it needs to go to a subcommittee, can it, can it go to a subcommittee with everyone's agreement? Uh, pub public Works, I know, reviewed it. Um, okay. I can s certainly uh, consult with the city attorney if it's you know, within the purview of the city manager to sign or how the approval mechanism needs okay. to occur. No, the Potter Valley project. The Potter Valley yeah. project. We had talked about that before, yeah. I think. Oh, yeah. This and is what Eric's Watt keeping England. a pulse on, right? Mendocino. Yeah. Okay. Anything else for um, city manager reports? No, no further reports, Mayor. Okay. Um, Mr. Cox, uh, did you have something to share with us? This is the end of the, the meeting tonight. Uh, earlier this morning, uh, uh, the city of Cloverdale lost a good friend, uh, as well as the county of Sonoma and the state of California. George Ortiz passed away this morning, so oh. I, if we could uh, uh, close the meeting in his honor, that would be very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Buck. Um, last item is um, city council direction for future agenda items. If I may? Yes. Anybody want to go before me real quick? Nope. Okay. Um, can we have the discussion about the um, the uh, workshop, the um, retreat, the city moving council. forward with the uh, city manager review, just getting all that stuff going, especially before we hit the next budget year. That would be ideal. So I'd like to know where we're at on that. And um, I'd like to, to see how the council feels about um, the capability of carving out certain aspects of the meeting from the YouTube video to then be posted separately. Uh, an example I would give would be uh, this evening's half cent sales tax discussion. It, it's one thing to refer people to a, what is now going to be a four hour and nine minute meeting uh, versus taking out just the, the presentation and then having that be a, a clickable item. Um, I just kind of wanted to see if we, if we could uh, entertain that, and, and that, that's all I have. I guess we should ask the videographer if we're doing chapters or if we're, we're doing corresponding um, agenda items. Um, Mayor, if you can uh, uh, and council direct our clerk to work with our, our videographer, uh, and um, we can provide a report back on how and if the videos can be segmented in such yeah, a way. Yeah, because you should be able to index them. Yeah, that shouldn't be. I think at one time they were, yeah, yeah for a short period. <laughs> thank you, thank okay. you, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank, thank you.
Um, okay, well, if that's all, we're going to go ahead and close the uh, city council meeting, and uh, we'll just take a moment in remembrance of uh, George, George Ortiz. Okay, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Irene, thank you. Chief? <coughs> Mr. Mr. Raccoon, thank you.